Commissioner Mike Mitchell, Commissioner Frank O'Donnell, Commissioner Rocky Smith, Here. Commissioner Adam Marl, Here. Mayor Denise McGriff. Oh, thank you, evening. Uh, so for May 7th, our next work session, uh, we have the Parks and Recreation Master Plan update, uh, the System Development Charge Reduction Program, beginning that discussion, and then uh, Park Place uh, Code Revisions for implementation of the uh, Master Plan up in the Concept Plan area. Uh, June, we're looking at the five-year pavement maintenance utility plan update, and then, as you recall, in our last meeting, um, we were canceling the June uh, 19th meeting because it falls on a holiday and it's not being rescheduled at this point. Any items that would have been on that date, we're going to pull forward to the June 11th meeting. Those are the updates for May and June. So the um, system development rejection charge, that's the item that we talked to uh, Mr. Lewis about, the uh, historic buildings. That, that, that may be where it gets to. I think it was a more of a, what we were hoping to do was talk about the programs that we have in place, kind of what the SECs are, and then get direction on which way do we, you know, a little more 
refinement on what we're trying to accomplish and how we're going to uh, cover those costs. Okay. Are there any questions about the May and June items? I should say for the record that um, I will not be here for that meeting. Um, Commissioner Morrow is going to be available to chair the work session. I will be traveling. Um, I think I will be, let me just say, I think I will be traveling because you know how the airlines like to change things around. I'm supposed to be leaving, I'm supposed to be leaving on the 7th, but now it may be I'm leaving on the 6th because I just got another update. All right, let's move on to the next item. So we have annual report to the City Commission of the Planning Commission activities and from the previous year. That's Paul and Aquila, our illustrious community development director. All right, good evening. Uh, so we've got a brief presentation and I will, do you want to kick it off? Well, sure, okay. thank you, yeah. Honorable Mayor, Member Mr. The you are. Uh, oh, my name. Right. I am Paul Espy. I am the uh, acting chair of the Planning Commission. I'm actually vice chair. So, um, and uh, it's great to be here this evening with all of you to talk about where we have been and where we are going as a Planning Commission. And uh, Quilla was nice enough to prepare this uh, staff report. It kind of outlines everything uh, pretty succinctly and briefly, which is great. Um, we, um, throughout the year, we've, uh, received, uh, we've done a lot of presentations, uh, we've done some legal training from the, uh, Assistant City Attorney, Carrie Richter, on the code and, um, conducting yourself at public hearings. Um, we've had presentations from the DLCD staff. We also had some pres our presentation, and again, from Carrie Richter and um, on the legislative review from 2023, which would include the middle housing, um, and then uh, also received a presentation on the McLaughlin Boulevard Enhancement Project. project. Um, we had lots of uh, meetings regarding um, middle housing, and we discussed and gave input on middle housing Code update in January, February, and in March. Had a joint work session with the City Commission. And we included uh, land use affordability incentives, tiny homes, RV occupancy, and micro shelters. Um, we took action on several things last year, which included uh, recommending approval for a legislative text amendment for middle housing, technical revisions including setbacks in commercial districts, limiting the number of townhomes that can be achieved through middle housing land division and amending the number of driveways allowed for middle housing developments. We also uh, recommended or, yeah, we recommended approval for the legislative text amendments for the mixed use corridor zone district to allow utility facilities to have outdoor storage through a conditional use review. Uh, we recommended approval of a comp plan amendment to adopt revisions to the Oregon City Loop Trail. We did some variances, one to uh, the lot size of 10 lot townhome subdivision, and then also to allow um, the main entrance of Chase Bank to have a different orientation other than what was required in the approved parking adjustment, other than what was allowed. Can I on that a little more? I was curious about that one. Yeah, um, excuse me, so uh, the, the code in the mixed use corridor in the site plan design review requires that the main architectural um, feature entrance be oriented towards uh, Malala and um, it, they wanted to do something a little bit different. So they have an entrance and they have uh, some architectural features that are oriented towards Malala, but their main entrance comes off of their parking lot. There's also a grade change there to the sidewalk to Malala, just a slight one. And I guess the thing that I noticed, I mean, they built it basically on the same footprint as the previous credit union that was there. And they faced the parking lot because again, it's kind of hard to get from their door up because people would be going up over the bank and then through the landscaping and then onto the sidewalk, which makes Difficult. It makes sense. 
given given the, the constraints right. of the property. Yeah, the layout of the site, and um, it also kind of had to do with their interior layout as well. So but yeah, that was they had to request an adjustment for that. And then we also approved a variance for a garage set back on Jackson Street. All right, so um, our proposed work plan for 2024-2025 uh, is um, attached and is in the uh, matrix here. And there, it's all broken down in all of the things that we have been discussing since, I guess, January, right? Uh, yeah, actually, it started last fall. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. okay, I guess that's since I've gone. Um, so we looked at employment land development, uh, which would promote a development of employment la land along Beaver Creek Road, the Cove, and Rossman Landfill. Can I stop you just for a minute? Do you yeah. guys want to talk about these as they as we go through each one, or do you want to wait till the end? I'm willing to wait till the end. I think I could, yeah, I think I could... I mean, I don't know how much you want me to elaborate on these. I can run through them very quickly so that you can get to your discussion or we can talk a little bit about, you know, no, I, I problem just, statements. Well, for me, I'd rather just go yeah. through them as we, as we hit them if there's any con concerns or questions or support or whatever because there's, you know, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Well, I'm sure if you guys have some burning questions, you're more than oh, they're welcome burning. to interrupt. But, yeah, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> um so, right, so we did the employment land development um, uh, to promote the development of employment of land, land along Beaver Creek, the Cove, and the Rothman Landfill. And apparently we've received a grant to study the industrial land readiness along Beaver Creek Road in the Thimble Creek area. And um, we will rely on that study to develop a strategic plan to identify actions that will encourage um, the employment development in those areas. Uh, parking. So, as you well know, the, the climate-friendly and equitable communities Oregon administrative rules um, are uh, requiring cities to make amendments that will comply with the uh, current OARs uh, for parking. And that, if you're not aware, would entail reducing the amount or eliminating, in some cases, the requirements to put parking and leaving um, uh, parking to uh, I guess the the whim or you know the discretion of uh, a business owner as opposed to the city imposing specific parking requirements in that area. And one of the things that we had wanted to do is if they were going to do that and they were going to impose that and we were going to adopt uh, language that's related to reducing parking, that it would be a good idea um, to push, and I know that this is kind of um, uh, an invalid, or not an invalid, but a, a discussion that we've been having a long time, for a long time with TriMet about providing additional transit for those areas. So if you're going to reduce parking, then provide transit. If you're going to increase density out, um, you know, beyond the urban core, provide transit. So it just made a lot of sense. And uh, it might not be a bad idea for cities like us to get together with other cities to encourage the state to allocate funding for additional transit. We should keep talking about that so that we don't come back one day, or they don't come back on us one day and say, gee, you never really talked about transit, so we didn't think you really needed it. So... <laughs> Even though it may not happen, we should still express the need as what the bottom, I guess, what the take-home story is on that. Well, the real take-home story, and, I, and the reason I'm going to make a comment here is that uh, for the last 10 years, I, you know, just in conversations with different people, I said, you're asking us to make changes to things where there isn't the infrastructure in place, and so to reduce parking without increasing transit makes absolutely no sense, which probably, and for me, was one of the reasons why we, I felt compelled to join the, the lawsuit with Springfield. Mm -hmm. Not because I was against climate-friendly communities. Right. I'm supportive of that. I'm supportive of the dog and the tail being at opposite ends, which they are, and the tail's wagging the dog instead of the other way around. There needs to be a more holistic approach to this stuff. they are not doing that. Yeah. And I had a yeah. very long conversation with uh, Governor Kotex housing, chief housing advisor, mm -hmm. I've had conversations with TriMet, and it was like, I mean, I love those guys, but it was like, 
I could have been talking to the wind. Right. Um, but, but, and I realize that, but I think we need to keep talking to the wind because... Yes. No, I agree. I think we need to keep yeah. harping on it. And I, yeah. and I know this commission is not supportive of reducing parking down to the point to where there is no parking requirements. And I think right. um, we're trying to come up with a... We're trying to thread a very fine needle. Um, and, you know, if DLCD comes back at us about it, then, you know... So be it. I, I, I'm not saying we won't do it. I'm just saying that we need, we, we don't have, there's no way people in Oregon City are going to get out of their cars unless the bus lines make it convenient to get to them where they want to go. And now, as we all know, there it's not convenient. And the people that don't have the option of a car, they are spending an inordinate amount of time using transit to get, you know, they all got to go downtown and then come back out and, and you know, even the West Line, which is supposed to be, you know, the greatest thing since sliced toast, only goes, you know, between Tigard and, and, and Wilsonville. Yeah. And, you know, we, and if you look at the commuting patterns we have in this town, I mean, people are going everywhere. It's not like there is a specific path right. to get there. But Exactly. And the response from them would be, oh, well, we're just going to eliminate parking along bus lines. Well... Okay, there is a bus line in that location, but yeah, a, a, yeah an yeah. alleged bus line. But you know. there should be yeah. so availability I, I, for I feeder think lines that and that We sort have of to stuff. help the right. planning commission understand that that we have a pro we I mean we have a problem. And we can't completely capitulate to all the way to nothing. Obviously, if you've seen around uh, banks and lending institutions that are lending on housing are still making some requirements for parking and that's just the way it is. The, yeah. the new development on Malala Avenue near Domino's, they are going to be using some of Domino's parking lot that's unutilized for parking for their residents. Interesting. Because obviously you can't park on Malala Avenue, and you can't, you know, I can't see people parking on this opposite street behind, which is May Street, and then walking around. They're not going to do that. Yeah. So it's really, you know, we're kind of between a you know, a rock and a hard place. And when TriMet looks at transit planning, they only think of the hub and spoke that deals with Portland. Right. And there isn't any other spoke for the hub. Um, the Washington County hub isn't even, doesn't even work as well as it could. Well, so we, we're, and we're kind of, you know, we're kind of in between those two. And yeah, so we're, once upon we're, a time, we're stuck. the regional center plans were supposed to cover all of that stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but yeah we know we, how well that, how that, did that. All right. <laughs> I don't want to interrupt. So I, this yeah. is something we probably need to have, like you yeah. say, more conversation about and try to figure out. Well, it's not much. It, how to make it, it isn't work. much that the planning commission can really do, but it's something that planning commission that need that, a, that the planning commission identified that could telegraph to the electeds and have them interact with other electeds within our region to um to raise this because i don't think we're the only uh, no, we jurisdiction are. that has this problem so just make sure it works up the, the food chain so that right you know we're generally not going to have the planning commission out there advocating Right, and so that segues, you know, we can have the same discussion about um, housing and under the category of education and interdepartmental coordination. We have affordable housing and middle housing, of course, and um, so some of the remedies that we have um, proposed is to provide education uh, for first-time home buyers, and it would be great to have banks cooperate with um, loans that were a little bit easier to get into with maybe down payments that weren't so big or any of that kind of thing. Um, but that's another story. Lot averaging for middle housing. Can we get rid of that? <clears throat> that's fine. Yeah, I, I, you, you want to lot that size averaging you want to remove? No, no, I'm just saying we need to get rid of it. I never liked it from the beginning, from the get-go. Well, that's a discussion we need well, to I know, but have we because need I'm to on the other side of the fence you, on that. Do you think we need to have that? Yes. I think it's unfortunately been abused. That's entirely possible. Well, it is but not I in the code right now. It was, and then it came out. So right. It isn't lot averaging now, but it, it was one of the topics that came up yeah. for discussion. I think you don't want to get into a situation where you have a lot sizes where you're going to require variances for to fit the to fit the houses on. That's you know whenever you have a bunch of variances coming in, then you know that you don't have the right lot sizes for the zone. That's usually the indicator. But 
we don't have too many. It's not, it's not too bad. No. So, but yeah, I, okay, so that's, that's good. Um, and then um, incentivizing, retaining existing housing to maintain naturally occurring affordable housing, which I think is a good idea um, and appropriate for, uh, you know, historic preservation districts. And exploring tools to support affordable housing, um, you know, so looking at other types of, um, so we're really asking the question about what, how the city can provor, promote more affordable housing and, and looking at the programs that exist, um, you know, for first time home buyers and, you know, more affordable housing. So I think, can you tell me how this ties back to, I, I, just for the, for the, the public, so some of these things are a little bit, depending on how you want to look at planning commission's roles, and obviously two of us on here have been planning commissioners. So how, um, because this isn't involving any code changes or involving other things, um, it's, it's a little outside of kind of what planning commissions traditionally do. So is this something that the planning commission is looking at trying to expand the scope of what they do or because it's not something you guys can actually legislate or say, well, we're going to do X. I wouldn't say that. I think that it came up as wanting to know more. And there is an understanding among the planning commission, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's an understanding that um, they're not going to be directing any work that's going to come from your policy direction. But there is an opportunity for education. And so it... To me, it seems like kind of low-hanging fruit to bring a couple folks in who can talk about what affordable housing looks like. Mm -hmm. And um, if there's something that the Planning Commission then wants to uh, request of the City Commission, then it, mm -hmm. okay. it, it would go that well, that's route. what I assumed, but I yeah. thought, well, let's just say it. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. But yeah, that's the, that's the approach. And I think I said that really clearly to the planning commission and yeah. thank you for yeah. reiterating something that as well i think we go in this category is that you know we're re requiring more and more compact growth how do we provide in our code some incentives for amenities because you know some of the things that, that came out of the legislature that didn't get approved which really was, i was grateful is that oh we don't need balconies and we don't need you know we don't need windows we need to have less windows um you know things that would make a building that somebody's habit, have, you know, living in, by having a, you know, having a balcony, they could open a door and have some fresh air. You know, could they have windows so that they can actually have light and coming into the place? And so, things that are coming out of the other side is like, well, those things just cost us money. You know, let's eliminate windows. Let's not have balconies. Let's not have porches. Let's not, you know, let's not do all these things. We just. We're just going to slap them up and, you know, right. and some of that didn't pass, but it was just the whole idea that, you know, if you have to live in a box, we need to make sure that the box is, so I has would, got some things. So I would respond to that by saying that the Planning Commission's approach to that should be, you know, allowing for variances to setbacks, uh, allowing for additional density, allowing for additional maybe some building height uh, allowances. So that they get, so that developers are able to achieve more units on a, on an individual lot. But how do we get the amenities? And, and then preserving, and maybe even enhancing the design review requirements if you're going to have that many units in a in a given space. If you're going to increase the number of units, but that that would be the way I would want to go about it, as opposed to allowing, you know, um, less. Wind, less demonstration or less articulation of the building facades or, um, you know, uh, public gathering spaces or other kinds of things that make, uh, you know, that vitalize mm -hmm. downtown areas. I think those things really should be preserved, especially if we're going to have more people in those, in the urban core or, and, and, and so we do, but we do have kind of uh, bimodal, approach to middle housing and we have we have allowances that are in single family lots in the r10 r8 r7.5 is it here 
Sorry, yeah. eight point. Yeah, eight, eight, eight. All right. Yeah, sorry. Uh, you know, out, out in the hinterlands, and, you know, so we allow up to four units, I think, on each lot, middle housing. Um, but then we also allow for, you know, housing increase in the urban core, and so I think those two, those two nodes really require different approaches. So I would say that out in the subdivisions and out away from the urban core, you would allow cluster development, things like that, that, that would uh, maybe be a little bit more aesthetically pleasing. And then, you know, you, you do- mean like preserving some open space or- Preserving, preserving open space, the trees. Because yeah, I'm thinking I'm of the sure. Trimble Creek area. Yeah. Where there is a lot of habitat there that if it's done correctly and done with that in mind, right. you can put houses in places so that you're not completely you know, clear cutting everything. So allowing cutting, addition, yeah. Cutting roots of trees. Additional incentive and, for preserving yeah. the Enrod right. yeah, areas and whatnot. Additional density in those areas. And then, of course, in the urban core, allowing for maybe additional density there and building height and um, perhaps less parking. I don't know. But that, again, would depend on, you know, depends on where it is. transit demand. And that depends, depends on where it is. Right. So it's a it's a complicated problem, and you know the the holistic approach is is needed on that. Um, some of the pieces are there, and some of them are not, as you well know. Um, but those are the things that I think we have been thinking about as planning commission. I'm hoping I'm not going too far off the rails on this. No, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so then the next part of this, of course, is the infrastructure and growth. And I think you were telling me that we are looking at sewer and water and transportation master plans to accommodate for middle housing, or is that right? Is that well, happening now, or is that going to happen later? I think it'll happen later. So okay. part of the idea with this one was to really just get some clarification from our public works director about how master plans are put together, infrastructure master plans, and how they anticipate growth. And um, we did have some more um, analysis done with the middle housing work that looked at infrastructure. Uh -huh. And the, the main idea with that uh, analysis was that um, it looks fine. We need to keep, keep our eye on it, keep reviewing it. And then in the next uh, updates to these plans, like look at the actual historical data for what, what was um, built. And, put that into the modeling for the new, for the updated infrastructure plans. But the idea with this was really just more education about how do we, because the planning commission is seeing different requests for growth, so uh -huh. how how does infrastructure accommodate that? That was the main. So more idea. more looking at the baseline um, and coming, coming at that from baseline strategies and looking at sewer, water, and transportation master plans as they are today. Right and then using that as a jumping off point for um, addressing any issues that arise from middle housing. Does that, right. does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it also needs to look at how we can use the existing infrastructure or upgraded infrastructure for, I'm particularly interested in infill for commercial and industrial properties, and rather than you know going outside of the lands we have already planned and zoned. So, I've come a long way in my thinking about what growth means and over the long term, and this is just my only opinion, is that the growth is not, it's not sustainable. And we have to look at how we take the existing area that we have and redevelop. You know, I've even, I've said years ago on Planning Commission that the, a place like getting a grant to study how the Oregon City Shopping Center could be redeveloped. Not that I want to see the Oregon City Shopping Center go away, but it's got a lot of area there that could be something else. The Berry Hill Shopping Center is another shopping center where, you know, we didn't require all that parking. They met our parking requirement when we approved that, and then they put in all that extra parking. Well, what about the idea of taking that shopping center or another shopping center and look at how it could be more of a... Uh, development, an integrated development that has housing, jobs, and shopping amenities right there. Um, 
And so, you know, I worry about this whole thing between Fred Meyer and Safeway and all that, that that might go away. But it's, you know, there's, a, there's no food desert there now, but there could be. And so what are we doing to take a look at property that's already zoned, already planned, and how to enhance what it already is? Um, the only time I've ever seen that shopping center at Oregon City Shopping Center filled was the day they had Santa Claus and the reindeer. That's, so we're planning for one day a year when all the parking spaces are full, but that shopping center could be so much better reutilized. And we've now got the Firestone building that's, that's empty. I try to imagine what that could be with a variety of other uses there. Um, still having some maintaining some of the parking, but on those edges, putting something else there that would enhance it and make it less, you know, I think if we were building that today, it wouldn't be all the way back at the edge of the, you know, the edge of the property. It would be closer up to the street and that sort of thing. But, you know, that's that whole visual thing that they were doing in the 70s. But it has a lot of potential. It's just that we're not looking at in our state about how to do that. And we talked a little bit about that at Impact, about taking those underutilized areas and repurposing them, not getting rid of what's there unless it's you know one of those shopping centers that just doesn't work like the strip, strip centers. But we have viable uses at the Oregon City Shopping Center, but what else could it, could it have there? You know, on a bus line, or good bus line for once. Yeah, yeah. You know. Should it almost be part and parcel to a discussion of you know, of the employment areas? It exactly. should be added into that. And then also, yes, exactly. um, you know, the economic development uh, group in our city should probably have a have a say or, or an active role no, in I that as well. Um, in designing, you know, an RFP or whatever to send out for a grant to put together on how we would actually reutilize those areas. To me, that's perfect uh, yeah. use of, of the of the uh, planning grant money they have from DLCD. Yeah, yeah. It, it it works, and it's what we're doing with the industrial lands. I mean, it could be the same thing with some of the commercial properties. I mean, you think about the other areas that we have, which have sort of the same sort of. Not as old, but you know, this center where Bymart is, mm -hmm. you know. Those are our, those are the older ones. The, the one Hagen's is a little, where Hagen's was, is a little better. Um, but, you know, how can we make that work better for the people to live, that live here and who might be coming by to shop there, or maybe that's a place to live? I, I just think, I just think that it, there's a broader focus for that area. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to it, that's for sure. So we also talked about park and open space and growth, which I think is probably one of the most important things we could talk about when we're talking about increasing density in the areas we're talking about doing that. And um, we, got our, we received a really great presentation on the Parks Master Plan um, last evening. And I think they're thinking about a lot of those things. Of course, I think, it, you know, a lot of folks think that it's really important, and I agree with them, that, it, that we need to maintain what we've got and, you know, make sure that the parks that we have are in good shape and can accommodate as many folks as possible and as many of their diverse activities that they have. But um, also, we added uh, some ideas about becoming more aggressive about just the land acquisition, even if you don't have the money to develop the parks um, as we expand out into our urban growth boundary and, our, and we develop our urban services boundary, we really should be thinking about acquiring the land. The land banking. For the, for the parks. I think that would be, I mean, if I were king, that would be um, priority one for me as far as this category goes. Yeah, we need to find a way to, to finance all of this so that we aren't. Well, yeah. And, and that's not a planning commission issue. Yeah, that's more of a, you know, we need to do it. It's a big picture. But then, you know, if, issue. if we want to look at the planning commission uh, side of things, we would probably want to look at things uh, that would afford more open space in cluster style developments and other types of. And I know that plan developments is sort of a dirty word in the planning departments these days. <laughs> <laughs> It's really, um, 
I think that it is, if, if, it's, if it has the correct rules and provisions, it can be a really good, it can provide a good opportunity to provide some open space within those denser areas that we're talking about. And I think, let's see, we've got, we've got a little bit more, right. Um, so for future considerations for policy directions and code amendments, we're looking at, um, on 7th Street and Malala, we're looking to increase and attract uh, vibrancy, commercial uses on the ground floor, mixed use development, where we have commercial use on the ground floor and um, uh, family homes on, on above. There is also a concern about um, going up too high and making sure that view corridors were protected, which I think is a good idea. So perhaps, you know, rather than having, you know, the, you know, large buildings that have no articulation, maybe there might need to be some design criteria incorporated so that, you know, those view corridors are protected. Are you talking about specifically on Malala? Yes. Because we do have a height on in on Seventh Street once you get past Eastham. Yeah. So there is a, a restriction on how high you can go because it's a conservation district. Okay. But, yeah. Good. All right. So we do need to maybe define the problem statement a little bit more, and um, maybe we did, you know talk about maybe looking at setbacks and height limits and, and that sort of thing to see if there was anything we could do there too. Well, you guys all know that there are places as you go down Malala Avenue, if you're in a certain spot, you can actually see, you know, Mount Hood. Yeah. Um, and I, are you talking about trying to protect some of those types of views? Is that what the planning commission was uh, I think thinking that, of? I think that specifically it was brought up that as you drive down 7th Street, you know, as you make that turn around Eastham School and you drive down 7th Street, that some of the view corridors to the hills on the other side of the Willamette River would be blocked if uh, buildings, you know, taller buildings were allowed in those locations. You can see the Westland football field from there. I'm not sure that's one of the views they were trying to preserve. <laughs> yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah I, I don't. I don't think that's going to be a problem. Yeah. Because of the other things that are allowed in that that are allowed in that district. So the other thing, you know, and I don't know if we really discussed this as a planning commission. This might be the place where I'm going off the rails. But you know, creating public gathering spaces and and um, enhancing public art and other kinds of things that that add, you know, the other kind of implicit things that add to um, vibrancy and, and interest in, in the community when we do look at, um, you know, the future development of those areas. For my, for my, from my standpoint, I would appreciate you guys just uncoupling 7th Street and Malala. They're not really the same type of corridor. Sure. Um, Malala is definitely what, you know, sort of general commercial of everything ah. whereas the 7th street corridor even though they have similar zoning it's a completely yeah. different animal that's good to know and so they really yeah. should not be treated the same mm -hmm. um there you know there is a slight transition as you as you stated as you make that turn mm -hmm. and as you come down 7th you've got sort of a different look and feel as opposed to that's absolutely correct. Um, you know, yeah. that part of Malala between Beaver Creek and there, which, you know, has some street enhancements, but, you know, not as much as the ones north of that. So it's, they're not, I don't think they really should be treated in the same way. They really need to be looked at as two distinct individual areas. Um, because they're not, they're not, they're just not the same. You've got more, well, you've got fast food, you've got lots of um, retail that is uh, for the automobile traffic. Um, you know, in 7th, we've got basically Dairy Queen and Mike's, which are drive, drive up and drive through that 
are different, and they and they do have that on Malala, but those are the only two that are in that particular corridor, right. and that's because they've been there since, well, how long, Rocky? Forever. <laughs> long time. Long time. There's, they're both MUC1, right? I think so. Yeah. But one has a historic overlay and the other doesn't. <laughs> Does that impact the uses? No, it impacts the design standards. Okay how it's reviewed. Um, I guess if I could say a couple of things on this particular topic, it's pretty broad, and I felt like every time it came up at Planning Commission, it kind of grew. Um, so what I was hoping to do is kind of bring back some of the work that's already been done on these two corridors, because um, there are things that I'm not aware of that Commissioner West had pointed out. You know, there's there's been some studies that have already been done on both of these streets. So I'd like to just start there with let's kind of get a basic education for everybody. So a baseline. Yeah, a baseline of what's been done, what kind of plans have been out there, um, and that might help kind of refine what it is the planning commission would like to see different about those two corridors. And that's a fine suggestion to is even helpful for refinements to kind of break them up and I think that was one of the um, questions I had had at one point I was like what geography are we really talking about here so kind of and flat <laughs> yeah right right <laughs> Hill and flat yeah um, yeah so that that would be one of the the items and then uh, the other thought was to see if um, uh, economic development would want to give a right. little bit of education about uh, the vertical housing tax credit as more of an incentive for mixed use rather than trying to have our code kind of be like a hammer or a stick and force things, but are there other ways to incentivize um, incentivize uses that would create, you know, pedestrian activity and more activity in those areas. So. Okay. No, I, I don't disagree. I think, you know, Malala Avenue needs more of that than 7th than seven. Street. Yeah. And, yeah. again, you're, you're trying to take an area, and, again, there are two different neighborhoods as well with different characteristics. You're trying to take an, a, a part of the corridor, which is uh, Dutch Brothers on up, which is super, super car-oriented. Uh, the uses there tend to and are oriented towards cars. If you just, you know, think about it all the way to Beaver Creek, as opposed to the area from Dutch Brothers, well, actually, let's go from Eastham, because that's not in the district, go further down. It's still car-oriented as people go through, but there's a lot more opportunity for um, walking, uh, walking to Dairy Queen, walking to Mike's, walking to here, walking to there. Uh, and then the first big car use you have there is, you know, you get lots of people coming in to go to um, the funeral home. You know, they're coming in and going out and coming in and going out. And that's obviously very car-centric at this point. But again, they have, like I said, they have different characteristics. And although they have the same zoning, generally some of the incentives for Malala Avenue are not going to necessarily work in the 7th Street corridor. Right. And in Seventh Street, and I think the same thing too is at Malala. You've got maybe two lots off of that, and then you've got residential, which is the same in Seventh Street, where you've got a one lot difference, and then you get into residential, you know, zoning. So whatever happens there is going to impact uh, those adjacent residential neighborhoods that are adjacent to that corridor. Yeah. And again, as a planning commissioner, I'd be talking out of school when we suggest economic development or even urban renewal or types, those types of tools to use on some of those more blighted properties that There's we have that lab. are underdeveloped or not developed or in, you know, a state of, you know, uh, path demolition and all sorts that of... That big building that had the uh, El Palenque in it for a while, the restaurant. Yes. It's just this gigantic warehouse yeah that has always been an underutilized building you know right. since the time i've lived here exactly yeah or the property on um you know the corner of pearl and malala over by measel yes that's an underdeveloped piece of property you know, they could so yeah, agree i mean i've been really kind of curious about what the situation is there and what sort of incentives if any the city could provide for 
someone to buy that property and redevelop it into something that would... The property owners are well known to the city, and uh, it is definitely ripe for redevelopment. It goes right. all the way back to that, I don't know what they were doing when they built that house, and they kept adding on to the top of it. Yeah. It's where the county, um, the DHS people park over there behind where Mitzilla used to be. Yeah. You know, it's basically a, a lot of uh, pervious... An impervious surface. It's just all asphalt. Yeah. Yeah, I'm at a loss. Yeah. To, yeah. It's probably beyond my realm of expertise. Oh, we could speculate, but we won't do it on tape. <laughs> but I think, but, but I think that, again, though, I think that that's probably a good economic development uh, thing yep. to identify. I would agree. Um, I mean, look at Copeland Lumber got redeveloped, and right. the planning department was in that building it's for great. a while, yeah, and it's. Great. Uh, it's 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 good that we were able to preserve. You know, the building wasn't great shakes when they bought it, but look at how it was adaptively reused, which I think is is good. You got something to say about Copeland? <laughs> Back in the day? Yeah, I do, but <laughs> it was a different time. Well, we moved the we moved the historic house that was on the property. We were paying way too much and signed the lease for way too long well that building. we're not talking about the lease for the building i'm just talking about the adaptive reuse of, yeah. the, of the building instead of it being torn down and something else going the re on. well the reuse of the building caused it to be so high rent that no one could take it except for city government offices yeah and the, and the state they're in there yeah so it would be good to look at the plans and see if there's stuff that can include that can encourage pedestrian activity like little gathering spaces and benches and lower speed would of, help too other kinds of things um, uh, right and uh, maybe as people develop their properties they can help with providing those things if it's proportional um, so that's yeah so finally we have um, short-term rentals and Plant Commission was interested in reducing barriers to short-term rentals. That is a red flag I, in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. I, I presented with great trepidation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, say... I, I understand there's a, you know, there's a tourism housing need mm -hmm. in Oregon City, but I think there's a very long list of communities that have done major damage to themselves with short-term rentals. So, if, you know, the, the, I think the controls that would have to be yeah. on it would yeah. be yeah. extremely And tough. it would have to be a lot yeah. of high maintenance. So, I, we, go ahead, Adam. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is one, because I'd be interested in hearing what it is that the Planning Commission is wanting to pursue, but like Commissioner Mitchell and I think the rest of my colleagues, this one uh, brings up a lot of red flags for me. Um, you don't have to dig very deep in the internet to read about communities that have essentially been hollowed out. Uh, you have people who don't recognize their neighbors anymore because they don't have neighbors anymore. Uh, like city. Uh, <laughs> Cannon Beach. Uh, right, and, and then you, you hear on. about complaints yeah. and disruptions yeah. in the neighborhood. Uh, but a big thing for me as well is, is I think it's in direct conflict with something that's already higher up on the list, which is the naturally occurring affordable housing. Yes. Uh, I think there's a big question of priorities there when it's uh, whether we want to allow more uses for people to have short-term rentals or for people to actually just live there uh, because it's already unaffordable as it is. Uh, and I just worry about what the relaxation of these standards uh, would do for that affordability environment additionally. So, Absolutely. I'll just leave it at that. I so, would say at this point, yeah. I would strongly, that we would strongly recommend, if I can speak for you, you take this off the list. This is going to be a policy decision for us. I, I really do not feel comfortable with the Planning Commission tackling this. I have several people in this community that I know quite well that constantly ask me about this, and I said, you're going to hear me say this, that while I don't agree totally with everything that the state's been doing with housing, I know what is happening to people that I know yeah. who are looking for affordable housing, particularly in my neighborhood, that cannot find it because some of these places are being oh, illegally used, and I'll say on the record, illegally used for short-term rental. And I'm going to go yeah. out on another limb and say I think we need to crack down on them because they are disruptive to the neighborhood. I know one that there's a complaint almost every other week because of the people that are there and the disruption is causing to the neighborhood 
and the people who are surrounding it don't want to alienate the property owner. But I said, well, maybe you need to because this person is causing you harm. I mean, they're getting woken up in the night. There's, they, they don't live there. There's no incentive for them to do that. And all it is is taking away. There's another person I know that was renting a house in McLaughlin. And she decided to, uh, because of her something going on between her and the landlord, she couldn't find anything in our neighborhood. The two places she looked at, both being used as short-term rentals, that would have been affordable. So with that being said, <laughs> um, I'm curious if you could relay to us what prompted that to be put on here. Because like I said, I, I understand that, I mean, the tourism aspect of it, but for me personally, I'd like to see that redirected more towards hotels and exactly. being able to leverage that more in the tourism conversation. Sure. Sure. To that. Yeah. Um, so some of the conversations that I heard about it, right now, uh, short-term rentals are allowed through a conditional use permit. And so the idea of reducing the barrier would be looking at another way to regulate it. I think... Uh, where the kind of seed of the idea came from, and this is a conversation I had had with uh, Chair Stoll, is that if it's done, I don't know what the correct way would be, but if it's done in a certain way, it can allow people to stay in their homes if they need additional income. So, for example, a personal story, like my mother-in-law who lives in uh, Boulder, Colorado, so not really an affordable place to live, um, rents out has Airbnb on her one bedroom where she allows one person to come stay right. um, who needs to go to the university for whatever reason and that supplements her income on her you know, uh, limited income. So the idea was more along those lines. How we actually craft that, I don't know. But the idea was, is there maybe some room in between um, the, you know, uh, using up all of our vacancy for affordable housing and, and having a conditional use permit. Because, you know, my mother-in-law, who's close to 80, isn't going to go through a conditional use permit for her one bedroom. Um, but she lives there. It's the people that are she, well, yeah, that are renting. So See, that it, could be part, the of, part of the, the problem. Is it's a slippery slope. It's an enfor To me, it's an enforcement nightmare. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't. I looked in the code. I didn't see the word short-term rentals. It says you can have a bed and breakfast or a boarding house. I would personally yeah. like to see us take the boarding house out. Boarding houses are a thing of the past. Yeah. I had one in my neighborhood that claimed it was a boarding house. The police were there every other weekend. It was a nightmare. She was renting out rooms in this building, and the people that lived right next to her, I was a little bit away, so I didn't get it all the time, but you know, you, you'd wake up and you'd see the lights flashing. You'd think, okay, what now? What now? I mean... So the city of Lake Oswego developed specific language that addresses uh, short-term rentals, and one of the provisions that they have is to make sure that the person that owns the house lives there. So you can do a short-term rental, you can have an ADU in the backyard, but you have to live there. It's completely, yeah, the, and, and having or, an ADU is completely different. You can do an exchange, like if you're going to go to Europe and live in somebody's house, they can come over here and live in your house, short-term rental. But anything else, you know, and, and we are trying to keep the corporations out where they are buying up multiple houses. Oh, it's already happening in Oregon City. Trying to do that. And yeah. they're, they, yeah, and we, you know, it still leads out into uh, the desire to rent pools for parties. I've heard about that too. Uh, and so Luckily, that's because. We don't have a lot of pools in Oregon City that they, people well, are trying to rent out. Yeah, but I, yes, I heard about that. Different community, and, and maybe it doesn't apply, but that's, that's the. And we also couple that with a fairly. Um, uh, proactive code enforcement program. So see that, yeah, it, but, but the thing is, is that, like I said, I didn't see anywhere in the code that the word short-term rentals was being used. Yeah. I, I, I don't think it is. It is. Yeah. And so, again, the boarding, like I said, boarding houses, that's that's from back in the, the 50s and 60s when we had some of those in Oregon City. Yeah. Um, a bed, you know, we need to have, if we're going to, we had four or five bed breakfasts here yeah. in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. They worked fine. We had one exception where the owner lived next door to the particular place, but they were there managing it. It wasn't being, you know, that they're in Timbuktu and this is going on. Yep. You know, we have people who, um, like I said, built 
an accessory dwelling unit for the purposes of I'm using it for my studio and now it's a short term rental because I see it come up, you know, I look them up every so often, it comes up and I'm thinking, okay, I know where that is, I know where that is. That's how you find them. And it, again, I think the housing issue is more compelling for me because when you have now, you know, we're up at the 570, the average house price here, yeah. and you have people who can't afford to buy but they could afford to rent and you're competing with somebody who's you know, wanting to use their property. Uh, and I know that this one place where there's the complaints all the time, the owner told the neighbor that they specifically bought it so they could rent it out. Never came and checked with the city, you know, or anything like that. And so now it's an after the fact with everybody in the neighborhood being, you know, in that surrounding area being upset about this because it's a party house. Yeah, and it makes things a lot more cut and dry for those people that are doing it illegally, you can say. We don't allow this in the city. And I've been asked many times, yeah. I've just said, no, we don't allow it. Yeah. And if you want to have a bed and breakfast, you need to live there. You know, you, you, it's not like, you know, you can just operate it from afar. Or, you, you know, if you can build an ADU, you can, but you're still living there. That's, you know, but again, we need, you know, to have some incentives that people buy build ADUs so if their mother-in-law needs to live in it or they want to rent it out or you know even a you know a tiny house not a, a mobile one but you know somebody could have that so it just I, I think it's I think it's something that like I said I think you've heard from us that we're not well, we're, we're gonna we're gonna have to deal, we're gonna have to deal with it eventually but I, I will say that's fine the yeah. reason why I asked is because there were instances where I think that there could use some clarification, which both of you have elaborated on yeah. with the Lake Oswego example and then the Colorado example. I think if, I don't know what the current language looks like, but if we were to clarify uh, insisting that the person who's renting it out also has a, a personal stake in the neighborhood by living there at the same time, I think that would be something worth looking at. And, and we need to recognize that Airbnb is a lot different from what it used to be. It started out as what you were saying your mother-in-law does, which is like the single room type thing while you're still living there. And now it's become entire homes that are being rent out. And so um, I think we need to evolve with that and make sure that we're being on top of those regulations. Sure. But if we were to look at those models of what Airbnb used to be like when it began, I wouldn't be opposed to that. Yeah. So well, there's also the RBO, which again, that's, yeah. and they've been, I don't know what it is, but on the regular channels, not the cable channels, Airbnb has been advertising like nobody's business. Yeah. It's not, it's been in the last month, just constant. And then the RBO as well, so. I think they're actually having a hard time economically. I think that there's a, a bit of a downturn in the, in the Airbnb market. I don't know. Right, about now. You go into the NASDAQ and look at what they're doing there. Our, yeah. I think our I think our charge really is to provide, a, you know, uh, ideas for diversified housing, you know, including, you know, affordable housing, you know, looking at these kinds of things, um, you know, Airbnbs and whatnot. I don't but, consider an yeah. Airbnb a vacation rental as diversified housing. Yeah. Right. It's probably. Yeah. I mean, housing. I'm thinking about for people that you know need a place to live. I mean, we don't want to become one of those communities where people who work here can't even afford to live here. Yeah. And we're and we're we're creeping up on it. Not that it's going to happen tomorrow, but it's it's terrible. Fair enough. Well, yeah. The planning commission did prioritize these, so the right. the Seventh Street Malala is the number one priority, and I think um, focusing on that will take quite a bit of effort and time before we were ever to move on to uh, short-term rental. So what about the RV park one? I'm curious about that one as well. So we, I think we had a discussion about the existing RV park and then we talked about Do we actually have in our code, we allow RV parks somewhere? No. As a conditional use? No. Nope. We used to. <laughs> I think so. A straight up subdivision. Back in the day. Because yeah, you can't discriminate against housing type. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So RVs are considered a housing type. Yeah. Well, if you if you partitioned it up, just like if you put you take the manufactured home, yeah, you took yeah. took the wheels off. Okay. But this came out of the uh, Clackamas Park right. discussion. Um, and the idea that... Oh, no, 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 I know. I can't 
cannot make the I cannot make that connection. <laughs> Well, so, yeah, I'll, I'll continue. Okay. The, the connection was if the city has the only RV park, um, shouldn't there be the allowance for a privately run um, RV park RV park yeah. as well? Okay. And that's where, so uh, otherwise, if we hadn't have been talking about that Clackamas Park, that I don't know if that topic would have okay. ever come up. But so that's the... That was the impetus, and there, I don't, I really don't believe that there's the ability for an RV park that's um, like what we have at Clackamas Park, right? Like a, you're camping kind of thing. Yeah, we don't have yeah, that it's kind of like allowed. Camping, yeah. So if you were to do a subdivision and put in a certain housing type, that's kind of a different topic altogether. This topic is really more about like a tourism type of camping place. Right. Okay, I thought it was more like they wanted a development where somebody could have an RV park and you could live in it you know, on a permanent, no, you know, basis. No. Um, yeah, for recreational, just, for recreational, just for recreational purposes. purposes. Yeah. So we do allow for manufactured dwelling subdivisions. Right. Yeah, and we did have so a discussion in about Laughlin, obviously we don't, alternative but. locations to Clackamas Park, and I think we're having a hard time coming up with an alternative location that would actually be, you know, a tourist type place that you could put something like that. I can't think of one. There's some kind of rundown housing off of the area where uh, the Newell Creek Canyon Park is. That might be a spot. Possible. Right. So that, well, I guess with that idea, I mean, the, so this came out as um, the lowest priority, but the idea would be if the city commission was interested. I think this would actually be a lot of work because what we would be doing is having to look at zones and where something like this might actually be appropriate and that um, is not necessarily a light task uh, to even start with that and there's a lot of um, you know community engagement and um, quite, quite a bit of work. I, that's why I put that it's a high level of effort. Yeah, I would think maybe. If there's any interest backing it up a step and saying maybe looking at alternatives for tourism development and maybe RV parks as being one alternative to that, perhaps maybe that might be Let's a little more Westland valuable. to put it but one on their waterfront. There we go. We can put it over there for once, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to lose sight on this one time we had the converted containers made into housing that showed up in there, and that shocked me. And I'm not sure how that works in the grand scheme of things or how it will be allowed. And that exists in one area that I'm familiar with. See that? The, the, the development off of Warner. Right. That's, um, it's a, I guess it was a mini cluster because there are three mm -hmm. units or four mm -hmm. units on one lot. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think it's definitely an option. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So essentially, they had to meet our design standards. They would just have to go through, um, I guess in that case, whatever the cluster housing or the multifamily housing design standards are. Um, and so when you look at those containers, you'll see that there's added windows or uh, just different, um, that's the, the one thing that's popping into my mind. They have some patio. Some of them have patio doors and you have a patio. Right to ha to try to meet the design standards. So. Are you thinking about the one up behind Milner? Yeah, that's yeah. what I said. Up a Warner. Yeah, that's where it is. Yeah, Warner Street. I'll have to take a look at that. Yeah, it's, I they, seen it. they have Carl Kaufman developed them, and they oh, okay. look they look really nice. At least the last time I looked at them. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know what kind of conversations they had with the building department about legalizing those for you know the plumbing and you know. Yeah, I think Mike was uh, here. Mike Roberts was here. But yeah, and I mean path and all that the insides stuff. are. They, he got package deals with IKEA. It's all IKEA yeah. on the inside. I mean, and the two-story ones um, that I went and toured down on uh, in Park Place are. Uh, they're. I mean. They're very nice. They're insulated. I saw the manufacturing process, how they go through and they repurpose them. Mm -hmm. And uh, are they allowed in the Glaffle neighborhood? They would not meet the design guidelines. Yeah. Nor would they right. meet Kanima. But they could be in your neighborhood. <laughs> no, they can't. But 
Let's just say, no, they won't. Yeah, well, I'm not saying they won't. Well, that's why I have covenants and restrictions. Well, yeah, yeah. But let's just say in, in another, in, an, in any single family neighborhood, if they met the requirements, they could, they could probably be allowed. They've been great ADUs. Yeah, I yeah. thought about getting one to get buy a piece of property out at the beach and plunking it on there. Mm -hmm. It's already rusted, so what could the sea air do to it? Fit right in. Yeah. Well, that's... I think that's yeah. it. Comments, I've, guys. I've got a question. Uh, somehow I ended up getting myself on a mailing list. Uh, anytime DLDC approves a city's housing production strategy, mm -hmm. I get an email about it. What's oh. We're required to produce one, right? And what's our time frame on that? I think it's 27. 2027. Okay. When will be... Uh, Either twenty, either we have to start in twenty six and be done by twenty seven, or mm -hmm. we start in twenty seven. But it's a couple of years out. Okay, because our city's already doing it. I don't, yeah. know, I don't know why they're choosing to do it now, but they, um, they've been put on. Uh, we're all put into like a time frame. DLCD kind of tells us oh. when we need to do oh, it. Oh, okay. Actually, I take that back. It's based on when we've done our housing capacity, capacity. analysis. Yeah. So we are. We just did ours. The housing needs analysis. Yeah, which yeah. They okay. changed names. Oh, thank you. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, the housing needs analysis. So um, we do that again. I I think it's twenty six. Oh wow. And then we're supposed to do the uh, production strategy like right after that. Okay. Great. Thank you. We've got a little time. Didn't short-term rentals come up a couple of years ago yeah. and we got into a big push and match about nobody wanted to pay the associated fees that allowed them to do that and we had we were talking about how we we're going to police those very things we had a long conversation yeah. about the enforcement part yeah. and it, we and just that, kept going and the cost of it and the inability we went down to do the, it the rabbit hole yeah i remember it yeah yeah because it does i know that our code enforcement people go out and enforce Illegal AD or not ADs, but um, I just, I just when you say hour, you mean like Oswego? Yeah. yeah, okay. I think we just need to do we need to basically inform people that they need to come into compliance. I mean, I, I think the city probably knows where most of them are, and it's not hard to find out where the rest of them are. And you know, it's, it's a slippery slope. I mean, do we just kind of go blindly, sort of ignoring it, and you know, wait for complaints to come in? Or, you know, so I, I'm not saying we do anything about it or not do something about it, do something about it, but it's definitely, I will say it's vexing to the people that these are around. I just think it would take a sustained and costly effort to I agree. set it up and monitor it. How long does the owner live there in any given period of time? And why are you gone? And when do you return? And you know, are there, there are the correct licenses procured? I mean, it, we we had a lengthy conversation about it years ago. I know when I was in Paris, um, it wasn't Airbnb, it was, or the R, the RBO, but they apparently have some, I try to get information about what they do because they do have people that rent out their homes and, uh, or their apartments, I guess, they're more as a home apartment. and. The, I was told by um, the person that whose house I was in that there is a very lengthy process, and I said, "Well, I'd be interested in that." And it was like, "Oh, wait, yeah, okay," but I, I didn't wasn't able to follow up with it to find out what they you know what they do in that. I know it's another country, but it's they're going through that right now because the Olympics are coming. I just hope we all keep keep in mind what our what is our goal: affordable housing for people who wish to live and work here. Right. And Everything livability. Else is, is it's a livability secondary. issue. Yeah, and the livability piece. Thanks. Great. All right. Thank, All right. You. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of fun. All right. One of our favorite projects is coming up. McLaughlin Boulevard Enhancement Project update. And we don't get to see one of John's amazing PowerPoints. <laughs> Do you need more chairs? I think we have a little sneak in here. You guys sit there. I'll sit right here. So I kept, I kept, a, I kept discovered I had a folder. I was like, oh my oh, goodness, yeah. I guess Sitting I kept some of this stuff. Yeah. yeah, I'll call you later. Figure out which one we're doing. Are we going up in the air? 
Are we going underground? Are we going through a tunnel in the river? I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> All right. Um, good evening, Mayor and City Commissioners. Um, I'm Dana Webb with the Public Works Department. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide an update on the McLaughlin Boulevard Enhancement Project. Since January, our technical team has been hard at work looking at those most promising alternatives through a detailed technical and feasibility review. This included structural, geotechnical, environmental, historical, and constructability reviews. From that ground truthing, two new viable engineering solutions were identified. We will share those with you tonight. Staff acknowledges both the complexity and newness of these solutions. The purpose of tonight is to share with you these solutions and to understand your questions and concerns, not for you to make a recommendation. Um, you each will have an opportunity to request um, additional one-on-one -on -one discussion with staff, um, and then we will come back to you at a work session um, date to be determined in May, where we will ask for your guidance on, on these um, solutions we'll share tonight. Um, so tonight with us, we've got Nick Gross with um, Kittleson and Associates. He's been with here here. Previously, and then also joining us tonight is Michael Roberts with HDR, a subconsultant to Kittleson on the project. Michael has over 20 years of experience as, and is a bridge engineer with a passion for structural design. Go ahead, Nick. Great. Thank you. You guys did so much work that you've torn your hair out about this, haven't you guys? <laughs> sure have. <laughs> Yeah, so um, we have, uh, and, and by the way, yeah, Nick Gross with Kittleson, a senior planner, you may recognize me, I've been presenting on this project a couple times now with you all. So we have um, a slide deck for you tonight. As Dana said, um, the purpose is not to come to a decision, but really more present the latest and greatest information that's uh, become available to us based on the analysis we've been doing over the last four months since we kind of saw you last. So um, let's get into it. Our agenda here, I will quickly just remind us of where we left off from what we called the three most promising alternatives. The meat of the presentation will be me passing the baton to Michael to dive into the details of the structural and constructability screening, which is really advancing and understanding the feasibility of constructing these alternatives to date or prior. We had just kind of shown a line on the map, and now we're looking at how these would actually be built and the challenges in doing that. And so that analysis that's been done has now led us to what we're calling the revised, most promising alternatives. These are two alternatives. We have what we're calling the conventional viaduct, which includes two signature spans, and then the second alternative is the long span, and then we'll wrap up with next steps, which Dana has already covered, but we'll just remind us all of what those would be. Um, I, I wanted to spend a moment just reminding the group here as well of uh, the purpose and need of the project. So this is something we established early on. Uh, the purpose of the project is to create a shared use path and streetscape that enhances safety for all transportation modes and bridges the missing link for people walking and biking on McLaughlin Boulevard between 10th Street and the planned open space, including the Tumwata Village development area. And then some specific needs are filling that gap uh, in the network with comfortable facilities, addressing the di disjointed and underutilized waterfront, and supporting Oregon City's tourism, economic, and community development goals. Um, I also want to remind us all that we've focused a lot on a regional active transportation connection here, but there is also very much a local need um, with parking, future access, tourism attraction to the Tumwata site, and that this connection could provide a, a new connection for uh, off-site parking, for people to park in downtown or around downtown, not just at Tumwata Village, and then use this connection to walk along McLaughlin uh, to the Tumwata site. So we're still um, in the since we last met and reminder phase of the presentation. We had three most promising alternatives. I'll cover them relatively quickly. Alternative 1B is what we call the full external alignment. This is a pretty linear alignment. 
alignment that runs parallel to McLaughlin Boulevard offset from the viaduct and offset from the roadway and passes through the historic arch bridge through one of the arch columns and then connects uh, at the elbow of McLaughlin to the Tumwana Village area. Is that at street level? <clears throat> this would be at street level, yes. Okay. The second is alternative 1D. We called this the partial external north tie-in. Um, this would run parallel to the viaduct and offset. It would then tie in on the north side of the bridge to utilize that uh, on-street parking area where that very large utility tower is located today. It would either bump out around it or traverse through it and then bump out to pass through the historic arch bridge, come back onto McLaughlin grade, and then work through that very uh, narrowed area where the parking is reduced or removed and then tie in at the Tumwater Village site. And then our third... I, I, I didn't hear something correctly. So mm -hmm. how are you talking about on that, the yellow line there going by the, the utility tower? Um, yeah, so we... This alternative has been dismissed, um, okay. but basically there are severe challenges in navigating around or through that utility tower. Um, and so we, we, we learned early enough on that it was not worth continuing to explore this alternative due to the challenges and constraints in working or touching that utility tower. Um, so PGE probably said, like, no way, Jose, basically. I, I think for a number of reasons. One, I think I even uh, talked a little bit about it too. We were still in an exploratory phase to understand if that is even a potentially a historic structure because it's been there for so long. The utility? Yes. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Before the arch. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, was, it was there before um, the bridge. Yeah. Right. Um, so this, this alternative and the next one I'll show have been dismissed, but I just wanted to remind us of where we were at. Um, the last one here, alternative 1E, the partial external south tie-in, um, runs uh, linear to the historic arch bridge, passes through it, and then ties back into grade, utilizing the parking area, and then somehow would work its way through that constrained right-of-way there where it really necks down. Um, and so these were the three alternatives that we uh, spoke with you all last time. And now we're going to kind of segue into the structural and constructability analysis that we've been working on. This is going to be uh, a bit detailed, and I'm going to encourage Michael to work through this relatively quickly, but slow enough that we can all understand it. Um, the last slide I'll present for now is just a sequencing of how we got to the revised and most promising alternatives that you will see here. So the technical work that we've been, we've been working on over the last four months, it's been sort of three part. The first is the structural and constructability analysis. This has been a lot of the work that Michael has been doing and his team at HDR. Uh, the next is a lot of geotechnical and archeological coordination understanding um, the existing seawall, what it can support, what it can't support, trying to understand what's behind it and a lot of the challenges archeologically uh, with that structure. And then uh, the cultural and historic element, we all know this is a extremely sensitive area um, from a cultural and uh, has several historic monuments there. And so all of this work is now, uh, and really, this is really the challenges. These are all challenges. This is feeding into what were uh, identified as the revised most promising. And the last reminder I'll say is, again, this is the conventional viaduct with two signature spans and the long span, which Michael will uh, present a little bit more information on how we got to these alternatives. So as we view these, I want to understand it. All of them are at street level, correct? Uh, yes, yes, for the most part, yes. And the, which of them establishes the greatest separation from the traffic flow? Horizontal separation. Which, which of those proposals will, will it be? Yeah, I'll show you some good pictures. Yeah, we have a lot of visuals. I think the short answer would be the long span is going to be more, uh, and you haven't seen that presented yet, but that would... It will be fully separated where the conventional viaduct actually kind of comes back towards McLaughlin and, and utilizes some of that space. Okay. 
we don't have the benefit of elevation views a lot of times, so I was trying to understand the plans. Thanks. Yeah, thank yeah no, thank, thank you, Nick, and uh, Honorable Mayor and Commissioners uh, Dana and Christina. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm pleased to present and fit in, in a short amount of time, um, generally at high level synopsis of the last few months as a lot of work has been done to explore this and uh, we're going to try and explain some of the structural solutions necessary to provide support for the most promising alternatives that Nick alluded to. So location, location, location. Um, you know, there's a third mile long riverfront site located along the banks of the scenic uh, Willamette River. But the falls close by, maps and views of West Lynn obviously across the river and a very wide range of ground conditions from one end of the site to the other. Um, is a particular tax that you're, you're focusing yeah, on? Yeah, so there's all, the, all that okay. series and, yeah. and numbers. What's the word there? I can't read this. It's bent. Bent? So yeah, I'll get to that in a quick second here. And okay. So this this is sort of seen in this aerial map, which provides some color-coded cues for topography and water depth adjacent to the seawall. So embarking upon an approach to consider conventional structure support options, we initially started with about 20 foundation locations, which were reduced to about 18 uh, due to conditions we'll touch upon and reflected in the slide. And so what you're seeing is the asterisk, is the yellow asterisk, of where we think the foundation could be. And the title of it is called the bent. It's basically the foundation element. And it's okay. titled from 0 to 17. So there's 18 total going from the uh, the right side to the other end. Okay. And then the other lines, those are topo? Yeah, so the, the lines, are the, the, the rainbow sort of color is sort of showing the, the intensity of the, the topography. And as you can see in some parts of this, it's very steep. And so on the, on the west lens side, you can see how it's very kind of more gradual, you know, what the topography looks like, right? Um, versus see on what we're dealing with along the front there. So is there any in-water work in any of these proposals? These are great questions, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's going to derive kind of what you envision and what you see from these solutions. Uh, so taking a bit closer look, starting at the north end near 10th Street and Oregon 990, we can see the availability of usable ground on the waterfront and the relatively shallow water depths in, in that region, noted bent zero, where Nick is pointing to, uh, to bent five. So the first six uh, asterisks is there, very, lots of good, good property there. And, and so Michael, shallow. are you saying there's like a bench there or yeah. there's, it, it, it doesn't just go Exactly, yeah, and I think you can see from the from the promenade area, there's a good, there's a lot of trees and foliage up there that kind of have taken advantage of that space. Um, and then as you go before, well, and I guess as you can imagine, it's critical to you know have availability of condition and capability for ground support for these options. You know, to kind of figure out what kind of structural superstructure and substructures need along this alignment. So absolutely critical in having some ground support along there. So moving south along that, we have a larger gap from five to six. Um, that's just due to the natural terrain there and diminishing amount of available ground there between 6 to 10, um, which kind of gets closer, closer to the arch and a little less ground support in that area. So through the geotechnical and structural screening efforts today, we found that there's pretty, pretty much little to no available ground south of the arch um, until about bent 15, which is far to the left there. So what's um, happening between 5 and 6? Part of what I, the yeah. question I have about this is, this is assume that this has been messed around with by by the the past people in this community right and that's not a natural riverbank anymore and so you mentioned the seawall and like i guess i knew that it was there but i don't know how long it's been there i mean is it so do you think that this dates from settlement time the alteration of the bank or you see that more as towards modern time it's a good question. I think we have a visual that might come up with the historic arts that might show you some of that in a gay context okay. of that. I think what's interesting to note, though, where the viaduct is between bit 5 and 6, the natural topography that the LIDAR shows is a, is a gully in that area, so it actually doesn't show you the surface. Yeah, it kind of it forms its way back, and then it probably reached around the, the city and kind of went back up towards the falls. So in that area, that's where the viaduct was kind of cr tasked with crossing over that area. So as a result, it's pretty, it starts to drop off pretty quickly in that bent 5 to 6 area. And so what you'll see in our solution is that we're not trying to mess with the water there, and we're trying to try and span through that um, in another, another, another approach. And just to put, bring it to some more context, Text that I think a lot of you would be familiar with the, the 8th Street stairwell right there that brings you down and you, you know you're underneath the viaduct and there's really you, you walk down and you're right at the edge of the water there so there's really not much land mass available in that space. So yeah I mean so we say uh, little to no availability of ground because we've determined in the scoping that there seems to be the possibility of support at bent 11 and 10. I say that specifically because Basically, that's the key to this project, is getting past the arch bridge. And so, 
At first, it seemed like there was nothing south of the Arch Bridge, and we had basically had to pack up and go home. But it sounds like from Geotechnical that there is a possibility at L11 that through creative engineering and structural construction, there's a possibility to get a support there. So I just want to kind of point that out as a possibility um, and a challenge. Um, but again, you know, in terms of the, uh, the river itself, it's a fast-moving and hydraulic abrasive, powerful force of nature, as we all know, separated by natural rock, and the seawall is perched above it. And that provides a barrier between the river, which fluctuates up to 40 feet between the high and the low extremes. Wow. So, and then I guess you know, before you go any further, Nick, the depth of the river actually varies from shallow up the north end there to uh, depths of over 100 feet in the areas shown by the darker colors. Um, you'll see in the section cut on the next shot in the top here that shows up. So, is there still any documentation left over from what ODOT did? Because obviously they had to figure out how to get the viaduct in there with less regulation than we have today. Yeah. So, they did, I know they did something. Yeah, and I think if you look at the viaduct, specifically the span arrangement, it goes from 30 feet to then a big one for 70 okay. foot across there. But the lucky, they luckily found some property in there to, to, to put footings on, and some of the findings of their analysis, we actually found the footings aren't sitting fully on footings, so there's fresh air under some of them. So it's one of those things that kind of makes you think about sort of how things were built and what's there today and sort of conditions. So um, in a nutshell, you know, I mean, there's no real, you know, no foundation location is similar to any of them across the site. They're very challenging. Um, they're either within close proximity to the existing seawall or utilities, um, both at the ground and overhead. Um, and of course, the existing arch bridge, which itself, itself bifurcates the entire site from north to south. So the intent of this slide is really just to kind of provide some clarity context towards the lay of the land and just highlight, at least at a high level, some of the unique challenges the project faces in, in finding viable solutions for the most promising alternative. We'll move on, but I also just want to point out, we'll get to this a little bit more towards the end, is there's a, a severe and increased risk in every hole or foundation that would be required for these alternatives. So minimizing the number of foundations reduces the risk, and, and that's kind of that archaeological sensitivity mm -hmm. of site piece that is still a fair bit unknown, but we know that it is a high-risk element of the alternatives. Yeah. Is there any cantilever construction proposed anywhere? Yes. I mean, over the seawall? We looked at that, and I think that's a good... We can come back to that and okay. talk about that, because I think it's a fascinating approach to take. Um, so jumping straight into the initial structural con configuration we explored to reasonably provide some support necessary, this slide presents a plan view of the conventional viaduct plus the two signature spans in this alternative. So the goal of this was to kind of maximize the use of conventional spans, leveraging conventional precast bridge beams that have span capacities about 90 feet. So this was done to explore and investigate the application of a familiar type of structure type that has reliable construction and costing data to support it and evaluate its applicability at this site given the ground conditions. So extending uh, from the north and on the left, um, the alignment connects at 10th Street at bit zero and then travels southerly using 90 foot spans that are parallel to Oregon 99 and have the same grade, maintaining at least a 22 to 27 foot clearance from the viaduct per some input we got from ODOT maintenance. And then between five and six, um, harder to see there, you've got the, that longer span structure there. Um, again, because of lack of ground, we came up with a 240 foot spandrel art structure that is there. And beyond that span, we go back to 90 foot spans. It takes us further south to the existing arch where there's two special foundations that we just talked about um, at bent 10 and 11. And those have been conceptualized to meet a 90 foot span needed to pass through the arch. So basically you need about a 90 foot to get enough space through it, but also it's pushing the limits of these types of conventional approaches. Uh, the foundation at, let's see, I've got a couple of visuals that kind of summarize what those kind of look from a sketch point of view. That's where uh, bed five and six are. That's where the viaduct has its biggest spans. And it's a below deck structure that kind of gracefully arches over there and spans that water area. And is that then, where you said the little gully is? Exactly. And it, it goes back inwards and there's a current water pipe that kind of ex exits in that area. But basically the, topo the natural topography is back up through that area. And those eighth street stairs are under that? Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. And that's where we had looked at ramps and other connectivity options. Um, but again, one of the structural things to keep, keep in mind. Mm -hmm. So I wonder why the county doesn't take that out. One of the... Um, one of the things we wanted to avoid is having any footings in there. Again, if it's a natural outlet for a river or gully or whatever it is, we just won't have 
mighty structures in there, so that's why the longer span exists there. So then moving a little bit further along, you'll see this kind of concept sketchily um, sketching up for what looks to be a 270 foot span. I, I want to kind of come back to the alignment. You'll see from one end to the other, it's not a straight shot. Um, it goes pretty much straight and separated from the viaduct to the arch bridge, and then has to kick back in to get back over to very basically where property is to get some sort of structure they can get up there. Basically, at that rock wall at Bent 12, just south of the arch, it's an abyss that drops off to 100 feet. There's no real opportunity for foundations. So what we figured out we could do is basically try and get through the arch and then and kind of kick it back to the parking area, put a foundation there, and then span with a 270 foot span, which is a fairly large pushing the envelope span of a tide arch, as far out as we could back over the wall and to an area where there's more property that we could probably tie it back in. So what you're seeing there in the bottom right is an arch concept that is above deck, and the reason for that is because we don't want to start excavating the parking lot any further than we need to, and also taking advantage of the structure above deck to minimize that impact of that location. So. In addition to the horizontal shift necessary to, to make this work, there's also a vertical shift. So we have to kind of raise up as you come out of the arch to kind of get the grade you need to kind of support the support to have clearance there. And so key takeaways from this slide are really that the alignment isn't perfect uh, from one end to the other. And the total number of foundations um, and the combination of bridges actually in this, in this alignment needed to kind of make this work. Oh. Oh, sorry, go back. Uh, uh, it is is that arch going to be in the way of the view of the falls, like if you were on the old bridge? Particularly, I think uh, it's, it's tough to, to say. The in general. Um, so it would be off to the left, wouldn't it? Yeah. This one particularly, the arch would be okay. I mean, you'd be on the arch bridge, you would have a full view of the falls for, for sure. Okay. Um, you may not see, I mean, as you're... As you arrive on to the Oregon 99 area above, above there, you may it may block that view from what being up on the roadway above Oregon 990. Right. You know when you're right there and you're looking yeah. sideways. Yeah. Okay. You can see Oregon. You can see the fall. So that would definitely be a, an impediment in that location. Okay. It's generally not where people are viewing it. They kind of either go to the mid span or they you know you see it as you kind of start going up towards the west wind side. So beyond the longer span solutions, our structural and geotechnical scoping determined that the most viable approach to support foundations in these other areas were, and especially in the vicinity of the historic arch, was a concept like this shown on the slide. It's a combination of lateral and vertical rock anchors providing anchorage and stability for a 90-foot span while addressing the challenges of unknown rock conditions. Basically, it's an extensive, an extensive series of nails to solidly attach this foundation to the, to the rock face and the available ground that is very almost vertical in many many cases. So although Bent 10 and 11 utilize this concept, um, other locations would also use it. Um, workaround is more favorable, less anchorages are needed, but just again, because of the, the, the sheer height of, of grade above the water and also the depth, um, there's still going to be a lot of overturning from seismic because a lot of the seismic wants to overturn this thing. So there's a lot of anchors you need at the bottom to make sure this thing stays upright. So, and again, keeping in mind what you're seeing here is a bunch of rock anchors. The black lines are sort of what you drill in there, but that's a series that goes three into the page. So we're looking at 12 laterally, nine vertically, um, and all in proximity of a very sensitive wall um, and utilities and you know, on a, on a rock surface that is unknown. So where are the utilities? Yeah, so the red dot in oh, the, okay. just but the base of the wall there um, is, is the gravity main, which is sitting in its own sort of cradle along the front of the wall that goes the entire site. Um, and then next to that is a gas line as well. So this footing is showing you kind of the challenges you'd have. Basically the water is fluctuating, you'd have to have a crew out there, probably from the, accessing it from the top of the wall. Mm -hmm and putting these and they'd be subject to permitting and, and, and water issues. Is that our line, the gravity line? No, it's uh, a county, yeah, west. Oh, it's uh, west is the line. Yeah, and we've, and we've been coordinating with them and brought them on as part of our project development team, so understanding what their access needs are to that pipe and how often they do view it and inspect it. And so we're... Uh, Where does that go? To the treatment facility. Well, and then goes from the tr treatment facility to where? It actually comes over the arch bridge. Yeah, from um, from so this is bringing from stuff over from West Lynn? Yeah. yeah. 
Well, no, well, I know, well, well there's one in 99. Nine, right. That, that's this it's one. And then you have Wes Lynn's. Our connection from Sanitary for West Lynn? Yeah, yeah, it, connect, it goes through the Arch Bridge and then it pops up on yeah. into that one. And then okay. down okay. over to the treatment the plant. plant. So okay. it's. But it's not, it's not our, our gravity line going there, it's coming from other places. We, we bring ours into it. This into is the main collector, collector. for Wes. Okay. Yeah. But we don't collect there. Ours is further down where we I have access to I'm, it. I'm not sure. I'd have to see where we have connections to that line. I think this line um, ultimately runs along the seawall and um, ends up in 9090 near the um, Tumwater Village site. Okay. So, yeah, just take note of the proximity of all these improvements there. Um, another location where our foundation challenge exists is just south of the arch where this, like you said, we jog back in towards 99E, the parking lot, uh, to kind of take up an opportunity to provide a foundation and a larger span option here. Um, we're showing this to kind of just show you the kind of the large diameter shaft that would need be, would be required in this area. Um, obviously, there's a very large equipment. You can see it out here just on, on the R205 project. That's the sort of crane that you'd need parked somewhere to put this sort of foundation in. Um, and also, at the same time, that kind of takes up space and takes a parking lot away as you have that span in that area too. Um, some of the big issues that come out of this specific foundation element are subsurface issues, a lot of unknowns. What are you digging into? Uh, what is just under there? Um, you've got the utilities, but you also have archaeological archaeological potential challenges. Um, and also, you're dealing with very large proximi close proximity to the existing arch. And also the seawall, which is very sensitive and subject to um, constructability impacts. How old is that seawall? It's not as old as the arch. We've got a picture. I think. But it's but it's old. It's old, yeah. Fifty old. to seventy-five years old. At least, at least, and I think it's it's unreinforced. It's just showing signs of some failures in some locations. That wouldn't uh, surprise so, me. So when we looked at scoping it, we looked at ways to kind of put foundations behind the wall and cantilever out over it. So that was a way to kind of avoid it. Um, basically, a springboard or a diving board over it. So that's one way to look at it. Um, but just because that type of structure doesn't have a lot of backspan to support itself, it's always leaning over it. So if there's any potential, any failure happens, people are going over it. And it's, it's just not a really comfortable structure to have. So we eliminated that for the purpose of that, plus a lot of excavation. Well, the last time I was on the river, you know, we came by there and you could see all those huge pipes. Well, I didn't have any idea of what they were, I knew that there were pipes under there. But I, you know, you don't see it unless you're down on the river because you're kind of looking up at them. So yeah. That's so scary. Let's move on to the next one here. So I think, um, you know, some of the some of the challenges at the site, you know, are I guess I think you get a sense of what's here. Um, we have obviously a historic arch with limited opportunity to pass through it or built near it. Um, we have the existing seawall. Um, Is which, that what we're seeing underneath the, the, the arch Yeah, so, so that's exactly, yeah, the image we're seeing. So we're looking back towards uh, the south, and you can see the seawall doesn't exist there. And that's natural riverbank then. That's right. So that rock, yeah, and, and on the middle image there, you can see that like rock topography there that's sort of what's there, and then they filled it up at Oregon 1990. That's basically fill, and then the viaduct. So that was raised up. So as you can see, that pier for the arch bridge was sure. fairly deep. Um, wow. So yeah, and then on top of that, we've got the seawall, which has, you know, potentially uh, unknown structural integrity and sensitive to construction on near or adjacent to it. Uh, potential structural liability if utilized for any support and if modified in any way. Um, and then we have also existing utilities that run along in front of it that take up as much space as they, as they have available there, and which makes it difficult to place other elements nearby. So if so, the seawall were to fail, that would probably take out those... Those pipes. Yeah, exactly. And I think there's interest in being able to replace parts of that. So one of the incorporations of what we're thinking through the structures is how do they get access to these pipe segments? How do they remove them? How do they put them back? Uh, so that's another component of what we have to think about in terms of structures that are here, sharing the same space. So, you know, river-based conditions impact from the time of year and extent to which work, work can be done. And almost all of the foundations, there's 18 of them, contained on this alternative make it substantially challenging from that point of view, and in water work, basically. So, along, let's see here, let's go back to this, this 
summary. So some of the advantages of this option are basically it's conventional, mostly for the most part. Um, folks familiar with this sort of bridge engineering are familiar with the, the technology. Um, that's also sort of one of the weaknesses of it as well. It doesn't have a lot of expanse for it. It's durable and has a below deck structure for the most part, except for the structure you're seeing in the picture there. Some of the big challenges are, again, this limitation in spans, um, trying to deal with the variable topography, and obviously the, the, the need for more access along the waterfront as you build it. Again, keep in mind this aesthetic values to this as well. You have to keep in mind for this historic arch. We've got multiple structures along the waterfront in close proximity to the arch, and also various structural types that also have impacts to aesthetics and, and the waterfront as well. What does that term mean, below deck structure? Below deck just means that when you're on the deck, you don't know what's below. You don't understand. It's hard to know what's supporting the structure. Okay. It could be an arch. It I could see. be piers. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of structures you just drive over and be an even on a bridge. Okay. So when you have above deck, it's something that's above. You actually recognize it's there, but it also has a visual impediment as well. All right. So some of the challenges with that. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, the site is constrained by the practical availability of ground, which is tough to locate and position foundations. And, and in this slide, it's, it's obvious to those who know the site and are aware of it, there's two locations of solid ground offering opportunity for support at the north and south ends. In between, it's a mishmash of difficult series of ground conditions with varying depths of water up to 100 feet. And we require a large number of specialized foundations to build and offer numerous opportunities for Pandora's box to be opened during excavation. So knowing this and to the extent which these challenges are prevailing for the site really limits the range of options and which really at the end of the day back the question what what if any more creative solution could join the dots located between these plots of available land and span between them avoiding the vast majority of issues we keep running into in a way that would mitigate and minimize the risks. So in an attempt not to give up and then turn away and say we can't find your solution, I mean, we tried harder and we looked for a viable project solution. We took a step back and we applied our expertise in dealing with similar challenges over hard to span project sites and considered the application of a long span cable supported structural configuration. Presented with numerous challenges, the project team pushed further to explore bridge types beyond conventional spans and in order to explore viable and constructible solutions for completing the most promising alignment alternative from one end of the site to the other. To determine an alternative conceptual structural support solution that could alleviate all these constraining obstacles, a long span supported structure was explored as it was considered key to leveraging the geometric and structural benefits of the structure type to address the site's challenges by spanning above them. So a long span suspension bridge is unique structural type which has an immense span capacity and can effectively fly above the ground issues without needing access from below. It's a, it's a style of structure that has inherent geometric properties which should provide major advantages to spanning the site challenges and places all of the foundation support in two discrete locations while providing the ability to work in the dry and take advantage of a high-line approach to constructing it. These types of bridges are effective solutions for specialty conditions where the boundary and site constraints are really difficult and the economical advantage uh, can be seen. By increasing the span, uh, fewer foundations are required, the value of long span structures are realized, and the reduced number of foundations provides significant reductions in risk and improved opportunities to avoid excavation issues and minimize the in-water and permitting risks. So with fewer foundation locations, the opportunity for cultural or archaeological impacts is also significantly minimized. So you may be asking, how on earth does the structural configuration fit on this site? So I'm happy to present the next alternative. Uh, noted on the slide, the alignment, you'll see it in here, is sort of in the same sort of context. It's a straight shot from one end to the other. Okay, it turns a corner at the far south, but we can explain that in a second. Seen in the elevation view, the long span cable supported alternative um, as shown would consist of a cable supported structure with the north foundation at, uh, at approximately 9th street and a south foundation at um, approximately 6th street. It has a slight grade to it, um, very very subtle and that's for the reason of the fact that it's a suspension bridge and they move vertically and so to, to maintain the arch and the geometry is a slight less than 1% grade from one end to the other with the, the peak of the bridge matching the seawall just before the arch. 
So this alternative spans across two challenging locations where foundations are really difficult to fight um, and, and avoids conflict with the existing arch and the existing utilities below them and above it by literally threading the needle with the most structurally and visually lightweight structure possible. Conceptually, the towers could be inclined or tapered, steel sections or concrete, to support the geometry. Um, and the reason for that is because at, at the far north, there's a ton of space and real estate to put backstays into the ground and anchor it very conventionally. At the south end, um, because of the water and because of the elbow, there's water there, so there's not an opportunity to put the anchorages. So we drop them vertically, lean the tower outwards, and we basically bring the forces back into the structure, most economy in an economic structural sense. And as a result of that, it means that the tower has to lean out over the river and the alignment is picked up below it like a cantilever. That means we can then turn around and create a new opportunity with viewing and other sorts of opportunities that go with that. Again, it's separated from the viaduct by about 20 to 30 feet. It's very lightweight. It's supported by a structure above the deck. So you would, you would see that above the structure um, as opposed to something that's below. And that allows you the opportunity to eliminate any potential for flooding or debris or anything that's below the structure and provides a bigger, maximized clearance and envelope below the structure for things like utilities and flooding conditions. So, last couple of images here. This is a nice metric of the, um, the view from the waterfront. It's sort of it's sketchy. Um, it's showing sort of how that threads the needle through the arch and then the tower at the far end. And these foundations are micropile foundations that are fairly sizable, but they're contained in locations that we know and we can inspect and we can visualize them. Um, there's not really many unknowns about sort of those situations. Um, and other options to that are large diameter shafts, which can be placed with large equipment in areas where we have more space uh, to support the structure as well. So both of these foundations require tie downs and anchorages. Um, this alternative obviously passes through the existing arch bridge and under the overhead catenary utility lines with foundations that are the farthest possible from the bridge, the arch bridge. The technical risks of the long span can be managed through design and construction, utilizing an expertise, and can eliminate many of the unknowns associated with excavation in or near the existing arch and behind the seawall. So with that, I'll just summarize the challenges are Again, obviously trying to pass through the historic arch. Unlike the viaduct option, however, the form, the natural form of the art of the suspension bridge allows us to provide a lightweight solution versus trying to come along with very heavy girder sections and trying to thread them through and then figure out a way to support them. Um, as a result, there's a significant re reduction in footing locations, which is a major benefit and focuses effort at these discrete, discrete locations which are visible. The long span alternative provides an intentionally contemporary structural engineering solution to address the potential aesthetic issues and the potential impacts associated with integration of the historic bridge and the site specific fabric of history and cultural heritage at the project site. And so this image on the bottom right is offering a conceptual idea of how the new view corridors are opened up to the bike and pet users of the, both of the falls and backwards to the existing arch. Uh, and as a result of the need to move the tower over and structurally provide that support. That's the kind of um, result that comes out of that. So I'll hand it back to Nick to walk through some additional visuals that yeah. you prepared. And I'll try to wrap this up quickly because I know we all want to chat about this. Um, so we do have some just, I think uh, you've seen similar images for the other alternatives we presented back, I guess, six months ago. These are just kind of side by side or actually top to bottom. Um, the long span on the top the conventional viaduct on the bottom. Um, this is looking, kind of hovering out, of course, over the river near 10th Street, looking uh, south towards Tumwana Village. The next is uh, long span again on the top, conventional viaduct signature spans on the bottom, uh, looking back now north, back at the Arch Bridge. We can come back to these as well if there's questions. Um, one of the benefits of the long span is this new as uh, new view shed, as Michael said, um, you know, kind of hanging out over the, the river. So having this new viewing platform towards the falls as well as back uh, at the historic arch bridge, you don't get that um, as part of the, um, the conventional viaduct alternative. And so just a couple last considerations. 
and then I promise we can get to discussion. Um, something that we've continued to keep in mind, and I know is um, at high priority for this group, is this concept of placemaking and riverfront activation. And so um, with both of these alternatives, we're looking at new parks opportunities, specifically linear park opportunities to help kind of create some more fabric across McLaughlin Boulevard. And so the image uh, on the top right side of your screen here is an example uh, in New York City of a linear green park. Uh, we're envisioning something similar uh, in potentially in the parking space that is utilized today, that same space that the utility tower is located, um, but opportunities for park and park space within that as well as community space. Um, the next are just some examples of path amenities and other additional details that we haven't uh, dove into in the design of this but want to be thinking about and wanted to present to you tonight. These are things like bulb outs, landmarks, uh, you know, human scale lighting, wayfinding signage, and, and, and landscaping and boardwalks. One notable image here on the top right side of your corner. That is um, in Vancouver, Washington on the waterfront there. This has been a, a major attraction for people to go out and view. It really has enhanced the waterfront and the opportunity of placemaking there. And created, Which one? Uh, top, right. top right. Oh, top right, right. okay. Yeah. And so it, it, it's again that kind of viewing platform where you're out over the water um, and just another attractive place to visit. The historic 8th Street Dock is something that we've talked about tonight, and in the past we've talked about the Frock Ferry. Um, so those two elements very much relate. The alternatives are thinking through how future passenger ferry access could be um, provided and making sure that the alternatives are not precluding, precluding any potential access for passenger ferry. ferry. Um, in this area, so whether that's utilizing the space near the 8th Street dock as it is today, it's a pretty optimal space um, and has that historic connection to the space there. Um, but just wanted to present the, the Frog Ferry concept and let you all know that it's very much at top of mind still for us in the project. I don't know the swimming part. <laughs> <laughs> And then I believe this might be our last slide before we get to next steps. This, um, this is a concept of the grade separated undercrossing. This was something that uh, you all raised the first time we presented uh, the, the project to you. So I want to give this group specifically some kudos on bringing this concept to the project. And as a result, we have incorporated and gone through a couple iterations of a grade separated undercrossing of McLaughlin Boulevard. It's quite unique unique, the opportunity we have with a raised viaduct. And so generally speaking, this would utilize the access of what is currently that 8th Street stairwell. You'd come down on a ramp, traverse underneath this path, and then the path would loop you back up uh, onto the main kind of um, bridge deck of the shared use path. So um, still working through uh, and the considerations and feasibility of this, but again, similar to the Frog Ferry, keeping it very much top of mind and um, making sure it's included in the alternatives going forward. Quick uh, update on schedule. So we're now into April. We're honing in, hopefully, on a preferred alternative. The next step would be, uh, and we'll get a little bit more into next steps uh, with you all on the next slide, but ideally we're going to identify a single preferred alternative and then start to develop an implementation plan going into the summer. <clears throat> so, um, summary slide here. Um, we have as Michael presented, two feasible and constructible solutions that, for the most part, mitigate the majority, if not all, of the challenges and, and real constraints of the site. And we've identified those through the technical work that's been done over the last four months. If neither of these solutions is supported, uh, something that we haven't talked about tonight but have talked about in the past is the Main Street alternative. And just a quick reminder of that, that would be crossing back at 10th Street, going a block or two over to Main, and then traversing down Main Street. And the challenge or sort of um, unlikely uh, 
solution to that is there, there's not a whole lot you can do. It's severely constrained. There's right-of-way constraints. There's historic considerations. The building frontages are really right up to Main Street. So Main Street would really look a lot like it does today. Maybe some additional wayfinding, maybe some traffic calming. Um, but that would be sort of the fallback if neither of the solutions that were presented tonight are advanced. Um, and for McLaughlin Boulevard, we haven't uh, lost track of the improvements along McLaughlin Boulevard. Uh, similarly, those would be primarily from curb to building face. So whether that's landscaping improvements, wider sidewalk or improved sidewalk where you can, we do have to maintain the four travel lanes that are out there today. Um, but there is uh, some sort of lower hanging fruit, easier um, frontage opportunities that would occur between curb and face of building. Last slide, next steps. Dana covered this um, early, but <clears throat> between now and May, um, city staff is offering one-on-one -on -one briefings with you all to ask additional follow-up questions or um, if you have concerns or um, really technical questions that you want to have answered. Um, those, and Dana can provide a little bit more detail on that if needed. And then, not specifically the May 1st session, but in May or shortly thereafter, we'd like to come back with you all after you've had some time to digest and discuss this internally and try to understand what a potential path forward is for this project, whether it's one of the alternatives that were presented tonight or um, the Main Street alternative. So how is, Dana, how is, um, how are other departments being able to input into this? I mean, are particularly thinking of the police department and uh, parks. Obviously those would be two departments that I definitely would like to hear some, because I don't know, maybe it's all the stuff you guys have told me over the years, my whole brain was going like, oh, that would, that would be hard to police, or oh, that's a great place for people to hide, or oh, that's where my, my brain was going, was stuff like that. I mean, I'm not saying that that's, but I was thinking of it from, looking at it from your perspective, and I think that there's definitely some value in having you input into this for your staff. Can we go back two slides? I want to ask a question about it. One more. So the lower walkway, that's below the street level. Yes, it is. And then to the left is downstream. Um, yes. So how, how far does that, what is the length of that lower walkway as it proceeds downstream? Is it of short duration or long duration? Um, it would tie, so it, it begins ramping back up. Do we have a visual? Well, it ramps up as we approach Go back to the, the arch bridge, but I mean, would go in the opposite way. How long does it, does it exist at that lower level away from the street? Is it a matter of feet or yards or? So at this location where the tower is, there's about a eight foot differential between the grade right. of the bridge, which Beyond that, to the left goes back at about three percent, back up to ten percent. Uh, sorry, to tenth street. Um, from here downwards to the right, it's about one percent. It's an arc. But and going it, downstream to the left, how far does that lower ramp continue on that lower walkway? Yeah, it goes about uh, four spans back, so four hundred feet, three hundred fifty feet. Oh, substantial, and it's down below street level, which would be a quieter walk. It is, yes, and, and yeah. Okay. But it's slowly ramping so, up. Yeah. To so what we're looking at, those those uh, concrete-looking squares, that's that's the viaduct up there, is what, I, what I'm what visualizing. Correct. That's correct, okay. yeah. Okay. Oh, actually, here yeah, is a good way to see it here. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, and there's a couple of reasons for that. The deck itself needs a certain, like, amplitude to kind of hump over to get through the arch um, and also maintain like flexibility and a nice arch. So that allows you to sink it slightly below the, um, the viaduct grade and then also back it out along a, a nice grade of 3% back there. So bikers would sort of head down towards the river at a 3%, hit the towers and then start rising back slightly, meet grade at Oregon 99 at the, uh, just before they go through the arch and then just come back down again before, after the arch and then turn the corner at a grade that's slightly different from Oregon 99 at that point. And you can do that with either approach, either the long span or the conventional viaduct. The the undercrossing you're talking about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think 
keep in mind the uh, the, the long span has a deck that's about a foot and a half thick. The viaduct has a deck that's about five six feet deep. Um, we're already pushing the envelope on keeping to the same grade as Oregon 99 with that thickness Kidding. to keep out of the water. It actually dips in the water near the arch, but there's a low point there. So any thicker of a, or larger span um, means that you're basically in the water for that style structure, which is not ideal. Um, just keep that in mind for structural depths, and that's why depths matter and spans matter, because the more Certainly. bigger span, bigger depth. Yeah, so oh, higher loads. Which one is thicker? Uh, the viaduct on the bottom, that's about five to six feet. She's using conventional girders uh, that we use okay. for bridges, whereas the long span is, is like this thick. So you're coming so, around the tower. Is that, you know, you said that the water fluctuates 40 feet mm -hmm. up and down, so it seems to me if we had another flood, flood. that would yeah, be yeah, in there. Yeah, it, it would be dipping in for sure. Sure, right. okay. Uh, and I think it's interesting that when, through this process, knowing what the levels do to the area and across the water, it's very fascinating. I mean, at a high water, 100 year, the, flood, the falls are basically covered. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, Noting that you'll see that in this area, that obviously that ramp under underneath the viaduct would be underwater too. The deck of the bridge would be above it, um, and obviously parts of the viaduct would be sort of touching the water as well. Right. So, so which still, of the two approaches is a more cost effective to build? Sorry, I missed that. Which of the two approaches is more cost effective to build? It just ballparking now. Cost effective. I mean, I think there's there's a ton of. A, there's infinite risk on the viaduct because of the unknowns and the subsurface, subsurface conditions. The technical risk of the big span is very manageable, so cost comes down as you get into these types of projects. Um, whereas the viaduct, it's hard to say. So it's hard to compare them very specifically because you're taking a square peg from round hole for a solution that doesn't really work at the site specifically, and a lot of risk versus one that seems a little more elaborate, might have a little bit more cost premium, but it's manageable from a risk perspective. So. Are you asking a number? No, no. I, it just strikes me that uh, from an aesthetic viewpoint, I think the long span is attractive. I think angularity is attractive in nature as opposed to 90 degrees and square and such. I mean, I've, I've been to lots of cities, Boston or wherever, where they got these suspension type structures and they're gorgeous. And they seem to be more open air. So, yeah. yes, sir. theoretically, and I will not even theoretically, but you could, in the, on the conventional viaduct, where you could end up with a situation where you discover really serious conditions and it ends up being financially not, not doable. Yeah, you may have to shut the project down or maybe it's being viable. I mean, we've seen similar cities have projects like the long span and they've lauded the experience of working in the in the dry and the cost escalation that comes from working in the river and the yeah. dealing with unknowns Orbit. and crews in the water and flood events and things like that so big advantage of the structures you put the cables up you throw them through and everything is delivered and thrown on the cables you're never in the water so it's a big advantage it allows you to have more certainty and that's what other cities have said is specifically on these types of structures that their costs are more certain versus these other ones where, yeah. you know, you get a flood and things go sideways. So am I seeing that right in the, in the long span picture? The, as it passes past the bridge, the, the cables are under, they're, they're outside where the arch comes down, but they're under the roadway deck. That span. The, the existing roadway like deck. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Correct. Where the okay. piers, the posts come as you okay, so climb. Okay, so it's, yeah. yes. Yeah. So if I'm on the bridge, I'm not that I'm not seeing any cables over my head. No. They're under. Yeah, like if I'm walking across on the, the bridge. Long span, on the long, on long span. span. Yeah. Bridge. You're driving. If I'm walking or walking or driving on the arch bridge, yeah. oh, the cables, right, right, right. Yeah, the cables for the long span right. are underneath. Right. You're going they're dipping under, yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. And I think I think the view from the, if you frame the, set, the site in the city, you'll see that the towers are really far away, and the idea is that they drop and they basically present your arch bridge to. We do have person. one image or two of them. This reminds me of the sundial bridge over in Reading. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, because right. of the way it. it right. So <clears throat> this is a visual to kind of take take a step back from the city. This is from the West Linton High School, and we turned it blue so you can see the bridge. Mm -hmm. But it actually does sort of like fade into the background if you have like typical concrete colors. But I think this kind of shows sort of the you know the the, the view and 
what kind of transpired. There isn't a foundation missing next to the south of the arch. I think it's important to recognize, someone pointed out as a QC reminder, there's a footing missing, but it's actually not because it's behind the wall. Right. So it is there. And so the idea is that, just keep that in mind, you, you know, you have an alignment that is beautiful on the north side, and then it kind of goes to the bridge somehow, and then has to jog over, and then hump over a structure, and then create this other opportunity there as well. So it's, it, I mean, like I said, it's the abyss, right? Where that wall is, where that tide arch is on the south, it's, it's vertical. Um, very challenging location. And we have do you have that same view? Yeah. Yeah. There, 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 there it is. On cue, on cue. Good job, Mike. The long, <laughs> the long span accomplishes that with that upstream pylon supporting it being angular. I mean, it's... So we're taking, taking cues from uh, Mount Hood, obviously, the same sort of geometric uh, yeah. uh, back span, four span. Um, again, I just want to emphasize that the structure is concentrating the foundations where you can go and see them and know what's there. Um, there's not a lot of unknowns. Um, and again, it's the lightest structure you possibly could get to thread the needle. Um, and as you can see, you know, the vertical street at, at the elevator there, sort of posted, probably is about the same height. I, I think it's about 90, 100 feet. What you get from this view is that, you know, when you're on the Westland side, when I've been over there, I, I look at the basalt cliff that goes up to the second level and you realize how very massive it is i mean you don't get that when you're down below you just see a section of it but to see it in in panorama like this you can really see that how the topography uh really changes i, I think the thing that that is really scary to me is what you said mike is that you do, you know, let's say you go along to, to on the on the viaduct span and everything looks great and then you get someplace else and it's yeah. the rock is not there or something's going on with it and right. it just you and you can't overcome that. I mean you can't you can't make it be something that it isn't. And you could you know, it could be fine until you get to the end or it could be the middle or whatever. I mean, that seawall, the fact that you mentioned that it's unreinforced really gives me a lot of angst. <laughs> I think the absence of a, a whole bunch of s supporting columns makes this much more yeah. attractive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I assume this would be faster to build. Well, he says pre less you bring the parts together and then you well, put it together so like, like exactly. tinker toys. You, you, nail, you nailed it. I think um, what you have access to is you have fabrication, which is mass production of the same element. It's the same bet, bet kind of everywhere. So as long as you get that lined up, you basically distribute them and then you slide them over the, off the bridge and these basically like necklaces fill, fill it up. Um, we've got a bridge in, in Eugene, which is built very similar to this, um, the Willamette, the, the Peter DeFazio Bridge over the Willamette Bridge, uh, it's a bike and pet bridge, um, similar style span, um, very similar construction, and you can see photos of how that was put together, then touch the water, delivered the panels, and concrete panels, and a very sturdy stru structural solution. <laughs> yeah, I think, like you said, 18 foundations, 18 potential Pandora's boxes, yeah. you know. <laughs> Versus two, right? Versus two, where you can see them right now. Yeah. Plus, it's more attractive from a tourism and economic development standpoint. Yeah, I think, and with respect to the, the towers themselves, we kind of want to say, like, stick a pin in it and serve. This is an icon. It's like a nice a way to kind of provide an opportunity for placemaking. It can be a material that could hide the environment and be kind of less obvious, or you could integrate it into some sort of uh, platform, viewing platform, structural elements to improve fishing or whatever has to be done to kind of improve the look of the foundation so it matches more with the rocks um, and become more natural. So a lot of opportunity to do things with it. Here. It's a nice concept. Yeah. Yeah. Cheers. I won't take credit for it. You won't or will? <laughs> well, sure. We've, I mean, like I said, it's a good this, concept. this is a solution that we really re reinforce that it's, it might be far flung, but Having seen the challenges we had to face on the number of foundations and the unknowns, um, when you start to think outside the box of beyond conventional, it, it, it answered, it checks all the boxes. It honestly does. And I think that there is challenges to the technical aspect. There is, I think, the question on will it be something that can build faster. Lead times on cables are approximately 22 weeks, generally speaking. But once you get that going, once it's set up, then the process of putting the structure together is very efficient. There's nothing affecting it, as opposed to ground conditions on another one where yeah. you've got the precast girders, guess what? The span just moved five feet. You can't just stretch the girders anymore. So things like that can happen on the conventional, and it makes it difficult. Again, when you look at the other arch, the tide arch that we were thinking about, it's a 270-foot span, which is pushing the envelope. How do you get it there? How do you build it? Can you bring it in by barge? Will it get it under the arch? Can 
getting you lifted from cranes sitting above the seawall, which is already precarious. These are really, really big, important questions, the yeah. constructability questions. I think that someone's got to take a risk on that. You can see the high school. <laughs> we've, we've talked at different times about how, you know, the, the infamous river walk, which hopefully will someday happen in this, <laughs> that, that really, <laughs> it won't. <laughs> well, I don't know. Hopefully. <laughs> In, in Before we die. But we talked about <laughs> that we should be thinking about the river walk as going all the way from Tumwater Village to Clackamas River, yeah. to, to Clackamas Clackamas River Park. Yeah. And this would do that. Yep. I mean, this this is this is a tourist attraction in itself, not just a walkway. It's a landmark. I think. Yeah. And I don't I don't know beyond the north to the south of this how that looks like. But I think I mean, if there was a bigger planning objective to connect the structure and eliminate that vertical tie, there's ways to kind of extend the span. If that's something that was potentially a future opportunity, um, I think it off because of the way it's sited, there's ways to connect it to it from other locations. So it's a very flexible structure. Um, but glad you have that. Interesting. Any other questions? Something for us to be thinking about, I guess. Thank you. Good job. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Lots to think about. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you want to take a Thank quick you. break? Uh, I would okay, we will take a. Sorry, I don't want to crank my neck right now. For... Uh, uh, how much time do you want? Oh, oh. Yeah, got 20 after? 15 after? Yeah, yeah just five. Okay. Bucky just needs enough time to hit the chocolate. Well, that's where we got to go. Okay, 15 after. <laughs> we're both. We're both. And it's 16 the after, because we're always one, two minutes after. <laughs> ten, 10 after, so. Oh, okay. Stand up. Stretch.
session and we'll go to um, city manager's report. Uh, thank you. Uh, so um, I have uh, provided in the packet for you tonight the update on some of the significant projects of, that the commission has identified. Uh, we continue to work with ODOT on the quiet zone. Uh, we worked with them uh, during the consultant review and ODOT's currently uh, negotiating with the preferred uh, consultant uh, for that uh, contract. Um, as they move through the negotiation process, the city will also be engaged um, in that process as well. Well, uh, Charter Parks, uh, we are finalizing uh, draft easements slash or license uh, to address encroachments uh, identified in the McLaughlin Promenade. So we should be moving that forward uh, within the next month. Uh, where we'll be starting that again. People. And the commission, yes. Uh, the Cayuse 5 Memorial, um, so the construction contract was approved by the City Commission and was awarded to Pioneer Waterproofing Company. Uh, the pre-construction uh, meeting is scheduled for April 15th, and then we anticipate work to start approximately uh, 7 to 10 days after that pre-construction meeting, so that's pretty exciting to get that project moving forward. So you say 10 to 15? Uh, after April yeah. 15th, yeah. yes seven to 10 days after April 15th. Um, sorry, uh, courthouse. Uh, so the mayor and the city manager met with the assistant county administrator to discuss the creation of a joint working group. It's anticipated the working group group will be comprised of six to eight members, including the mayor and the Clackamas County chair with the city and the county each selecting an equal number of members. Is there anything you want to add on this? I know there was some you know, identifying members, you know, essentially yeah. what it was, was the, the city yeah. would identify a couple of members yeah. and then the county would identify an equal. And I think, you know, when talking with the county from our perspective, it would be, you know, and I'm not sure where we're ending up on this, but, you know, potentially like a business owner, a property owner, a representative from DOCA. Yeah, right um, now we have um, the executive director for DOCA has accepted and then a business property owner, Ben James, uh, who's former chamber uh, president has agreed to be on it. And then I got asked um, whether or not there would be a separate chamber member. And I said, well, that depends on whether we have six counting Tootie and myself or whether we have eight counting Tootie and myself. And then I found out that the chamber's creating their own separate committee uh, that, with the, what is it? I never get the initials right, but it's the GEAC. GEAC, yeah. I always wanted to call it the GMOC. I don't know why. Um, I said, that's fine, just don't get out ahead of what we're doing, because um, we haven't started yet, so. And so I think in the discussions with the Assistant County Administrator, um, one of the things that we asked was, you know, to really, one, get clarity on what exactly is moving and what's staying, right? So it's, for example, we have the courthouse, we know that that's moving up to Red Soils, yeah. Liberty Plaza, and then next to that you have the Holman Building, which is the jurors and the law library. Right. Our understanding is that's going to stay. stay. Yeah, they want to keep that. But I'm not sure what's going to be in it. And then obviously you have the district attorneys and assistant district attorneys that are renting space. That are moving. Um, you also have family services that are down by TriMet. You have parole across the street. Um, so part of this is what, what's down there? What do you own? What do you lease? What's staying? What's going? And then... Um, you know, really part of this plan or this exercise is really to, to have a discussion about what, what's the disposition, owner, final ownership or transition of uh, the courthouse. We're not anticipating this being, you know, it's going to be X no, and Y. That's that, that, I think that's the that. next step once yeah. we have this kind of discussion that becomes a recommendation to the county commissioners on what the disposition of, um, of that courthouse should be. Is it, are they going to keep it, or is it going to be them with a lease? Is it, you know, is it is it the city? Is it urban renewal? Is it to the private market? So that's really the intent of this working group is to give a recommendation to the county commissioners on how to proceed with that building. Yes, I've got no indication from the assistant administrator about who they might select uh, for their group. But I, you know, I I was in talking with her. I was, you know, we want to make sure we have. Uh, invested stakeholders who can give us a, a broader perspective. So, I can see the courthouse going any number of ways, including private ownership. But I'm more interested in keeping an eye on the Holman Building 
because if that is not convert, does not continue to be used for juror service or some other, I don't want to be a, a, a cipher. And one more social service, I want to convert it and put it on the taxpayer rolls and locating a business there. And we got to stay ahead of that. Exactly. Absolutely. And I've I, expressed and I want that unofficially. And I want economic development to be. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. The other person would be lead. James. Excuse me. They ask. This county asked for James to be involved in this. He should be involved. And I said in yes. So that's that. that's that's our that's our third. Yeah, you got a huge economic development component. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. We don't need another agency. I do not. I was I was very polite about that. Good. Maybe don't blindside us again. Yeah, that's what yeah, I, I did. I did kind of use that. I used, did sort of use that word. I said we don't want another surprise. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because they do own the Holman building, that building. Yes. Yeah. But then the one um, down by uh, the, the TriMet facility. They don't own that. They don't own that one. It's the, where the Kakani Surveyor used to be with the drive. It had a drive up. Sorry. Are they renting it or what? Yes, they're renting it. Yeah. Well, again, we got to stay on top of these potential vacancies and have, and have possible placements ready to go. Okay. So we'll continue to provide updates as we put that working group yeah. together and, I, and whatever the conversations yeah. are. I asked are. her to, I sent a message Monday saying, where are you on your selection? Because we want to get, I said, we're already two years behind. We need to get moving on this. Okay. Um, so Tamwata Village, we continue to meet with uh, staff from the Confederate Tribes. The Grand Ron, uh, one update, um, that we were, so... Uh, 427 Main Street, so that's the large office building right on the corner yeah. of 99 and Main. Um, Publisher's paper. On, on that building. side. So we have signed off on the demolition permit for that building, um, and so we're in the process of finalizing the permit, you know, payments, getting it issued and whatnot, so just a heads up. Is it just going to get crunched, or are they going to try to recycle some of the material? I just, I really want us to put something in our code where we're not just dumping crap in the landfill. Good just, luck. I know. I mean, this is a private enterprise. Well, the city of Portland has some requirements about, about oh, deconstruction. <laughs> Not Portland, please. <laughs> I'm just saying that there are cities that do look at deconstruction. I Rather than I all of that, you know, we, you know, Eastern Oregon is, is not going to be our dumping ground. It's kind of what it's becoming. I have no other update on the Kanema right away at this point. Yeah, that's the one I find entertaining is the uh, quiet zone. The amount of two years for design Pretty work is like, is this the first quiet zone you ever did? No. How hard can it be? It's, it depends on which region you're in. The one down in the, that they have in Eugene, that took a couple of years, but again, it's a different region. We're in region one. So, you know, that in the future you need to... Um, not capitalized Tom Water Village. That's me. That's my fault. I'll catch yeah. that. It just automatically does it. Yeah. But yeah, I, I checked. I said, okay, no capitalized. Okay. okay. All right, Mr. O'Donnell, you said you don't have a report? I do not. Well, we did have a meeting, but anything you want to say about the last health? It was the, 20, the last meet, uh, meeting in March. I don't think there's anything significant other than American yeah, Waterworks, we American Waterworks upcoming, and but that's June. Didn't we and I think there was an agree plan? there was an agreement yes. to potentially work with the city of Portland for the city of Westland while the water line is city of Lake Oswego or Lake Oswego. Yeah, we talked was about a, lost, potential lost revenue and how we want to address it, it. It actually came to like three quarters of a million dollars potentially. We talked about a lot of things about getting ahead of some things with as we see construction costs and all. But I think it was just trying to coordinate a little bit better, like when West Lynn enters into an agreement that affects South Fork, that this group is aware is Oregon City is the yes. co-owner yeah, of South Fork. So I think that was more of just that West Lynn had entered into this agreement. For well, West Lynn was asking South Fork to enter into the agreement. My question was during our meeting, our pre-meeting on the agenda, as I asked, number one, had... Uh, the South Fork attorney reviewed the document. Number two, had the City of Oregon City's did, attorney right, review the it. document. Mm -hmm. and, they and they got sent because I said, we should not be signing anything unless each of the cities has seen it. It doesn't, I said, we're not asking for approval. We're just saying you need to look at it, see if you see any red flags. And since we own it together, I said, in future, all those type of documents have to go through all the, all the jurisdictions, period. It's just... 
and the way it's got to be. Capabilities and vulnerabilities is an ongoing discussion, and the search for funding to make sure we are able to continue to supply quality water uninterrupted. And you guys went on a tour. The tour was very good. The tour was a facilities tour that we will walk through and look at the ways of different things that need to be done and the costs associated and the different approaches to doing it, doing it piecemeal or ongoing uh, maintenance versus replacement. And I, I think there's some good, good thoughts going on about how to tackle this. So hopefully yep. we make some good decisions, but you know, there's a lot going on up there and water is the staff of life. So we need to make sure we continue to supply it. And we're also going to be looking at, um, do an SDC study because the SDCs need to be increased. Well, that's, I, I was, wasn't going to comment on that in depth, but you know, that's a lengthy process that involves citizens cost, gathering costs and then justifying SDCs. But quite honestly, you know, if you look at the cost of water itself, which we talked about, you know, one of our members put forth their water bill and it, the water itself only ranged from $5 to $16 a month. So, I mean, the water itself is not a high component of what we should be called the utility bill, but this is customarily called the water bill. Yeah. Used to be a water bill only and then yeah. other stuff. Yeah. It's just a vehicle for transmitting yeah. those other billings. Yep. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's about it. Yeah. The other thing, well, one of the questions I asked and uh, was before I had my surgery was, um, the building was built in 1955. It's it's cinder block. It's not reinforced. And I said, what happens if this building gets damaged? And all the equipment that we have underneath, because we're we, you know, they're up on the top. And then the other thing, obviously, is that um, I could not attend the meeting because it is not ADA accessible whatsoever. And I was not able to put weight on my foot at the time we had our meeting. And it, the stairs going up there, if you've been there, are really steep. Yeah. And uh, there's a curb when you come in, there's steps, and then there's more steps. And, you know, it's a wonder that Alice Richmond gets up there, but I think that she has help. So I said, you know, in light of that, you know, I'm concerned about the vulnerability of the building, period. Well, we talked about lots of things, you know, uh, alternative water supplies, both in the raw water form or finished water, and the ability to transmit that water to us in the event of an interruption. There was a very... Uh, very good meeting now. What happens now is the implementation and, and not only decision making, but then not the plan aspect, but the do aspect. So that's where it stands. Yep. So Clackamas Heritage Partners. Um, <clears throat> we had a meeting on the 4th, April 4th, um, and well, a lot's going on. So there was a lot of conversation. This was kind of a second meeting to discuss a lot of the same things we did uh, at our last meeting. Um, Gail is um, near retirement, and so there is um, a recruitment effort going on to try to find a replacement for Gail at End of the Oregon Trail. Um, the board is working to find new board members and... Um, kind of re, uh, re look at their mission um, in light of the facilities plan for the city. Um, I've kind of highlighted some of that with the CHP board and the conversation about, you know, what is the future of Clackamas Heritage Partners and the End Oregon Trail and, you know, how that relates to future facilities um, with the city. Has Kendall come um, and presented that portion of the plan to them? I mean, they have, you haven't had any they, meetings, which is part of No, it. so uh, as far as I know, Kendall hasn't presented to the, the board. CHP board, yeah. but has has had communications and meetings with staff yeah. uh, and Gail and uh, Fowler as well. Um, so... They, they have a pretty good idea of kind of the questions that I think we're asking in mm -hmm. terms of facilities, big, big question marks about facilities. I guess the only thing I'm trying to convey to the Clackamas Heritage Board is that, you know, the Land of the Oregon Trail is one of the facilities that have come up to the forefront as a big question mark in the swimming pool, things like that. And then how... Um, well, that CHP needs to have an understanding of what their mission is and what their future is because 
that should play some role in any conversation with the facilities plan. However, rebuilding a building down there or, or renovating the current building has to have a public support to it and encourage the Clackamas Heritage Partners to think very clearly about what their future mission is and how well that lines with public um, support. Basing the fact that most of us know that if the community or CHP or uh, the Heritage Coordinating Committee or whoever in that realm says, oh, well, we think that we need to rebuild the museum, that I doubt that would have a huge support from the public unless it was geared towards the um, interest that the public sees for that site, which I said means you know, focusing on concerts, focusing on the events, focusing on everything, and if, if there's some sort of cultural component that remains there, maybe that's part of it, but we know what the community would support on that site, and um, especially since my concerns about Clackamas Park as a venue for future big events, that leaves us with the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center for future big events, where most of our big events are happening already, um, and we know that those are supported by the public so I think there's a there's in part of that conversation about facilities at the end of the trail we really need to think about what does the community want that that facility to be and is it a museum or is it an event venue or all of the effects of some of the both you know that generates that public support so I think that's kind of um, the conversation that um, we've been having a little bit to think about that. Um, let's see, working on the staffing. Um, there's some there's some pro projects that have been calm, have, have been under consideration, and one that came up is this discussion about prior to COVID there was a conversation about a plank house being built on site, which I said, well, you know, with with the big question mark of facilities. I don't know where that process is through planning and how much of that ever got looked at, but um, you know that vision of having a plank house um, may be a little different now in light of the conversation with facilities, or maybe it'd be a part of that. I don't know. So that came up again. Um, the there's a huge partnership between and Thorgan Trail and. Um, uh, Confederated Tribes of Grand Rhymes with um, exhibits and things like that. So I think a real conversation about um, the stories that are told on the end of the Grand Trail site in the future and currently and how those balance with the stories that might be told on the uh, uh, um, Tumwater Village site in the future. I think those are all things that we need to consider. Um, the movie that has been shown um, you know, we've been in this weird, weird world of coming back from COVID and reopening, but also having staffing issues at the Oregon Trail and, and kind of maintenance issues. But um, we had kind of a kickoff to the movie, which is the Oregon's first people movie, and it's a really amazing uh, story, um, giving the native uh, perspective of the history of this place. We did a premiere in a sense with the. CHP board and the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ron who basically put the movie together, but we haven't done really a public, um, it's been planned, but we haven't done really a public event. There's talk of still trying to do some more of a, a premiere kickoff of it again. Uh, That'd be great. With the commission and other invited people first to, to kind of relaunch that. Um, and an effort to kind of continue that conversation of the facility and, and things in the future. Um, so that's one thing. There's also um, some conversations happening about doing a larger event in the spring uh, to bless the site and do a bigger, um, bigger partnership or bigger uh, event with the Grand Run. So those are things that for a future, maybe a year, uh, maybe next spring. Um, so it was a lot, a lot of conversation. I think we've decided that there's probably going to have to be some sort of a retreat because this is a organization that is completely in flux um, and is trying to find new leadership and people that are trying to kind of um, 
I'll retire. <laughs> step away a little bit. So. Have they started to actually put out an announcement yet about the position, or it's in the process of going there? It's not a re- uh, not quite yet. Yeah. They're 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 getting ready to start that. Yes, job description and all yep. that. Yep. Are they using a headhunter for, firm or? Um, they proposed a. Um, process lab at this, this meeting and it hasn't been finalized, but yeah, they're getting that point. Um, I think that's pretty much it. You know, it's a multi-use site. Yeah, oh, and, for sure. And, it, and, and each, just, each use is almost independent of right. the other. Then you get this ongoing and potentially evolving relationship with the Grand Ron that, you know, will things continue? Will this Will things move to Tom Water eventually or what? So, I mean, there's, there's a ton of questions to yeah. be answered down there. Yeah. yeah. Lots sure. of conversation. I mean, it's been good meetings, but it's a lot. Yes. Yeah. There's so many things that intertwine with the things that we're talking about, yeah. too. So, it's nice to give them a heads up about that and figure out how those blend together. Adam? So, CIC. Yes, so CIC, first off with some good news, there are three potential new active neighborhood associations. Uh, people in those neighborhood associations have reached out to the city uh, and Hannah has been great to work with for them. And so uh, hopefully, uh, and a few of them from those potential neighborhoods uh, attended our last CIC meeting. Uh, and hopefully uh, they'll be able to get up and running. That's uh, Gaffney Lane, South End, and Hazel Grove Westling Farm. So. Well, South End used to be a dynamic yeah, group. coming back. So these are these are used neighborhoods that already had charters, yeah, but they back. sort of are That's been good. on hold, is what I would say. Right. Okay. Glad to hear about Gaffney Lane. Um, we had some good um, uh, presentations, including one from Chief Davis. Um, there were a lot of good questions that were asked, uh, so we appreciated that. And then lastly, coming back to the budget discussion, uh, which has come back to us a couple times on the commission. Um, You'll recall that um, in our last approved budget, there were concerns that it wasn't enough, and that recently came back up because one neighborhood um, is nearing its... uh, reaching its balance. Um, And so the the, uh, suggestion from Jared was looking at how we distribute the funds that the city gives to the neighborhoods and finding a better way that the neighborhoods distribute, or finding a better way that the CIC can distribute those to the neighborhoods. Uh, because as it is right now, it's based on how many households there are in the, in the neighborhood, but a lot of neighborhood associations have varying amounts of meetings, and so you'll have big neighborhoods with a lot of homes that don't meet very often, but, but so we're having a second look at the formula uh, by which that money is allocated to the individual neighborhood associations because the problem is that that even though what prompted this second, third, fourth, fifth look, I don't know what it is by now, but what prompted this most recent look at their budget is because one neighborhood association was having issues with their individual budget, but when you looked at the entire CIC budget, it was there was a lot of money that was still left over. And so I think we're taking a little bit more of a productive uh, route by instead of saying that we need more money when there is still a lot of money to be used, uh, looking at how that's going to be doled out. And then uh, it has been communicated to them from us uh, when they've come before us that if they do reach that uh, that balance uh, and need more money, that, that that would be something that we'd be happy to look at. Uh, and I think that's still on the table, but it just needs to be proven to us that what's being done is cost effective um, and being used equitably across the different neighborhoods. Um, There was a a suggestion from a member to use up all the money because the city commission said that they would give us more money. uh, Who said that? Yes. Uh, Yes, he said. Yes. And so I, I put... I put it out there that there were no caveats, or, or there were there were caveats yes. when we said we would backfill that money. It was if they were used responsibly uh, and not going above and beyond certain activities uh, that were uh, done in the past. And so I, I made it clear that if that was the route that was gone down, that it would make it a lot less likely that that budget increase would be approved by the city commission. You got so, that right. So uh, I hope that for now this conversation is put to rest and that we can um, we can get back.
back to some good work here. Uh, Before you move on to that, <laughs> the money has never been allocated by neighborhood. Ever. By the city. By the city. Right. I know, and that's why I'm saying the CIC is going to. Right, and so I think that that is... That's fine if they do that, but that needs to be back-checked by somebody else higher, on a higher pay grade than them, because... Well, it was proposed by Jared. Well, yes, but it means that they could make a recommendation about what this would be, but the final say would be elsewhere. I, again, somehow or another, the misconception came about that each neighborhood had so much money, and it's not that. It never would work that way. Ever. But the way that they choose to do it yes. is that way. Yeah. By household. Yeah. And he's no, no, I'm saying that, you know, each day, let's just say each neighborhood got $500. It was never allocated that way. From us, no. Right. But the CIC allocates it to the neighborhood associations, and that's what Jared has proposed we take a look at. Right. And that's what I yeah. said. That's a new for So I'm going to go on to the next yeah, go one. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the Youth Please Advisory do. Commission, um, they're continuing on with their clothing drive. Um, we had a meeting last night. Um, and so there have been some good developments on that, and uh, we're approaching the recruitment season uh, for our next session beginning next fall. Um, this, this will be our first time actually being on the calendar because of some delays in getting this up and running. And so I'm glad that now that we've been able to do it, and I think that there's been great success in demonstrating that there is a need for this. And just looking at our last commission meeting when we had some great students presenting uh, their If I Were Mayor contest uh, presentations that um, this, this program is really growing and, and uh, becoming better and better. And so I'm looking forward to seeing that and getting out into the schools and trying to get uh, new students involved. Uh, C4, um, we heard about the STIF, the Statewide Transportation Improvement Fund. Uh, many of us, with it being tax season right now, uh, see the Oregon Statewide Transit tax on our, our W-2s. and um, So that's what funds the STIF. Uh, and so we went over that um, with TriMet folks uh, and uh, concerns specifically related to Clackamas County. Uh, Commissioner Savas brought up a concern uh, about one of their funding allocation models, which is what they call equity indexes. They look at um, different communities that are disadvantaged and use that to identify who gets more investments. And the concern that Commissioner Savas brought up was that in Portland and densely populated areas, the, the disadvantaged communities are denser, uh, whereas in communities like ours, we still have disadvantaged communities. They're just not very densely populated, and so uh, having concerns over how that uh, might affect the allocation of uh, stiff dollars uh, to Clackamas County, and that was a, a point well taken. Um, it was really nice hearing from TriMet about a transportation-related issue and hearing Oregon City mentioned so many times on an issue that wasn't tolling. Um, they were going over their plans, uh, and there were so many times that they mentioned Oregon City for great things like the uh, Oregon City uh, tri or Transit Center that they're going to be um, making improvements on, and then they've also uh, expanded the line from Oregon City to Tualatin. And so there have been a lot of uh, great things happening uh, transit-wise, and that's not to mention the work that's already being done with the uh, Clackamas County Connects uh, shuttle bus that's been going on for a while now. Um, Clackamas County Coordinating Committee tolling subcommittee, um, we basically d just decided that we're going to keep meeting uh, because it's not over until it's over with the whole tolling issue. Um, for me personally, I still, it, for anyone who believes that the governor does not believe in tolling is, I think, Delusional. naive to believe that. I think, again, as I thought it was for the last pause that was announced that this is a way for us to not talk about this in an election year when it's a very tough topic. Um, and so uh, pushing it off until the next session is um, strategic. Is very much a strategic move, I think, on her part. And so uh, we've decided to continue to stay engaged. Um, I have a lot of concerns because basically what the announcement was was that there would be no regional tolling, but that I-205 Abernathy Bridge is still on the table, contingent upon the legislature finding funding. ODOT is already so far in the hole that it's very difficult for me to think of ways that they're find, going to find a way to, to backfill that funding. And so this is still something that is very much on the table. And giving the public the false hope that this is over uh, is not something that we can do.
you don't, think, you don't think they bought that lottery ticket? They <laughs> worried about is that the IP4 people have stopped collecting signatures. Exactly. And they need to continue and move it forward, whatever they're going to do. I'm not saying I support it or not. Well, I do. Obviously, I have a sign in my yard. But, yeah. <laughs> so I, I do support it, but they, they're, they're being... They're not being strategic, in my opinion. So, yeah, we're going to continue to be involved, and uh, come 2025, when they have their next long session uh, and are slated to have their next big transportation package, uh, we're all going to be very eager to see what comes out of that. And that's what I have. Mike? Um, C4 Metro is nothing different than what Commissioner Marl just reported from C4. Um, the... Uh, Metro UGB 2040 uh, roundtable thing is still still meeting, and that's kind of a uh, three-part process. It first looked at housing needs. Um, interesting there that probably has it has budget implications for us. It has lots of different implications. The expectation over the next. 10 to 15 years is really very modest population growth in the area. In fact, natural population growth, which is births minus deaths, our population would shrink. The only growth is going to be from people who move to this area. So we're, we're kind of moving into it, I think, into a different phase of how we think about things because the demand for you know, obviously we've got a backlog of housing that we need, but there's not going to be those, they don't expect a big press of population growth. Um, the second step was looking at available lands, and they actually have, I can't think of a more boring job, they actually have staff people looking at aerial photography lot by lot in the entire metro area determining whether it's developed or not developed. I think I'd just go jump off a bridge somewhere. Uh, anyway, and the, the next step, and this, is, this was kind of interesting, and this is something they've never done before. They're actually doing essentially a pro forma that a developer might do on those undeveloped properties to try to determine what the chance are that they might actually get developed because there's actually some pretty big swaths of vacant land still inside the UGB, but it just won't pencil out for right. whatever reason, infrastructure costs or whatever it might be. So that's kind of the next step. How they're going to do that, I, I don't know, and I think that's the next meeting that we have is that. But it's um, and the purpose of the, this group, it's not, not going to recommend uh, UGB changes. It's, it's more to just uh, troubleshoot, bird dog the process to make sure that the process that they're using reflects what the stakeholders want. So yeah, you make sure that gets on his the list for his report outs. I'll, I'll, I'll right shoot him an email about yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. That's yeah. it. Okay. So water environmental services, basically it's gonna be budget time again and uh, they've appointed a, a, a budget committee and uh, I somehow or another got my, found myself on it. I was the only person last year that voted against the budget at the commission meeting, so I did not support the budget. <laughs> I'm sure that went over like a lead balloon. Um, Downtown Association is, uh, they're gonna have a wine walk on the 18th of March and they're gearing up for First City. So that's pretty much the trajectory. Um, the new executive director is doing a really good job. There are They've revised a whole bunch of policies and things that we have for financial reporting. Uh, we're in the process of recruiting new members. We uh, are bringing on Craig Morrow, um, who was on the board, is now coming back, which is great. Oregon City Brewing, the dad. Mm -hmm. uh, Metro Policy Advisory Committee. Um, basically, what we've been doing is reviewing the, as I reported last time, the regional solid waste plan. Uh, got an update on the UGB committee um, and interesting again those birth rates and death rates and um, you know as I said they were saying anybody over 65 is passing on is what he describes it as their their economy, their population guy I think he said I think he said aging out yeah he said aging out passing aging on out of the population. moving on oh, we're great. moving on thanks a lot yeah, but... yeah we're moving on somewhere 
we're, we're just going somewhere. I'm on those thin people. ice. Yeah. I said, I said, yeah, where are we going? Checking uh, out. Yeah. <laughs> he, did mention, out. He, did, he did mention the first meeting two months ago that they were checked out. And I said, excuse me, you know. Um, so anyhow, um, you already heard about South Fork, Willamette Falls, and Landings Heritage Area. Basically, the City Hall project is underway. It's under construction. That's the big push right now. Uh, the Ramat Falls Legacy Project, even though we're not uh, attending any of their meetings or haven't been invited to meetings, but they're in a, the executive director search. They had their um, interviews last Thursday, so I'll be interested to hear how it is going. Uh, the Locks Authority, again, budget. Uh, budget's coming up. Um, we're talking about whether we're going to go through a one-year budget process or a two-year budget process. And I'm also on that budget committee, which, you know, I do not like finance very much. Sorry, Matt. To say that, but that's not my expertise. But anyway, um, you already heard about the Youth Advisory Commission uh, committee com commission, commission should say Youth Advisory Commission liaison. Uh, the clothing drive was finally approved by the Clackamas uh, PTA, the Clackamas PTA, which is housed at Jennings Lodge. The one at the school they declined to participate. They said that's not part of their mission. So they are still going to do a clothing drive. One of the uh, one of the places to drop clothing off is going to be City Hall. I hope that's okay with you. We have a, a receptacle that that uh, that means none of you can go through the clothing. So um, so for high it'll be for high schoolers. And then um, I also wanted to report that Tony and I and John Lewis and Dana and Aquila and who else was there, we met with the TriMet staff down at the transfer station to talk about their plan, which I will say I don't really feel meets our needs. And we asked them to kind of go back and rethink some things. And uh, they didn't really come any, with anything new. They came back with the, sort of the same plan. Um, there's more buses going to be sitting on the street as opposed to um, anyway, it, it's it's not a great plan. We know that the facility, they're, they're basically trying to put, you know, a five-pound rock in a two-pound bag. And uh, there's just too much that they're proposing to happen there that the site's not big enough to fit everything that they want to do. So we're, we're continuing to have discussions with them about how to make this work better for the community. And I noticed, matter of fact, when I went to KFC the other day, they have that one bus that parks right by the KFC. It's like once that bus is sitting there, it creates a very problematic vision clearance issue because you can see until you get in front of the bus, and then you can't see if somebody's coming down 12th Street. And if you're trying to turn right or left, you can't see either way. And I thought, oh, this is just totally not good. I have so. a question, and this may be just because I thought this over the years because at one point that was city street on either side and then over the years it became is it only buses some, through there now yeah, both some of sides? it got vacated Did we give, we, so we vacated the street for for that right away or is that still our street we had some agreement with them on that i'd like to see them i don't know what the mapping is of that anymore yeah, we can get it to it's a little it. complicated it's, it's very convoluted it's all some type of right away whether you know parts okay. ours parts odot like parts. there's really no like where the building is yeah. in the middle is actually in right of way. Okay. It's not, there's not like a little lot there. Or anything. But none of those cross from none of those cross streets from what street would that it's be? It's 12 be? and 99 on either but side. Those of are it. all buses now, right? It's not. There's not a right. It's yeah. It's it's on it's, either side of the of um, the of the of the bus mall yeah. shelters. Yeah. Correct. It's, yeah. Yeah. We. It's yeah. And right it's right historically away. been limited to bus. bus. We did turn it around to try yeah. to stop left turns off of 99. Okay. Shooting um, in there. And, yeah. But then you still have, you come out of KFC and you kind of share that little end of the drive aisle there to get back onto Main, yeah. uh, Main, Main Street. Street. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's very, it's very interesting. I will say one time coming through there at night, I drove past 12th and I thought, oh, and then I thought, oh, that's right, you can't turn down yeah. there. But there was no buses there, so I did it. <laughs> All right, so um, that's that's all I have. Um, we will uh, adjourn uh, to executive session.